Ja. Like to call this meeting to order, and the first thing that we like to do is start off the meeting with singing of O Canada. So I'd like to—is our singer here? Is this our singer in the front here? Oh, terrific! So let's see if I can. Uh, let's see. She's hold on one sec, honey. Oh, this is going to be exciting. So let's see if I got this right. Sibylla, Malexa Day. Did I say that right? Sibylla Malekzadeh. Malekzadeh. Well, thank you. <laughs> I was going to say I was close, but I wasn't actually close, was I? Don't answer that question. So now, Sibylla is five years old, and I'm not sure she may be one of our youngest singers that we've had sing so. the national anthem, so you're going to set a record here in Niagara Falls. She's part of the music program at Stanford Lane United Church. When she grows up, she wants to be a scientist engineer. In the meantime... She's going to continue her musical studies, and she'd love to share her love of singing with her community. And today, she's going to sing O Canada. So whenever you're ready, Sibylla, we're ready for you. O Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all thy sons command with glowing hearts we see thee rise the true north strong and free from far and wide O Canada we stand on guard for check the records, but I'm pretty sure you please be seated that she would be our youngest singer of Ocana. Sibylle, did a great job. You've got a great voice. It's funny, some people just naturally have that gift and I can't even whistle on tune and, and the only get worse than me is quite strange. Oh, she was, she was enjoying herself. That was amazing. Yeah, like a Shirley Temple. That was dynamite. Sibylla. Oh, are you going to make me say it? Yes. The last is Sibylla, S-I-B-I-L-L-A. S-I-B-I-L-L-A. Yeah, it's on the agenda there, yeah. I don't want to go sharing that too publicly. She's great. Can we book her again? Uh, like, uh, I'd love to get her doing it every week. That was dynamite. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so I can put this away. So we are now looking for adoption of the minutes from the October 1st meeting, moved by Councillor Peter Angelo and seconded by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Are there any disclosures of a pecuniary interest of councillors? It's a worm in here tonight, right? A little worm? I don't know if our engineer guys, we can get them cooled down a little bit here, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at you, Mr. Nickel. Yeah, it's his fault, we don't blame him, eh? Oh, look, they're all pointing the fingers at each other, that's great. Okay, no disclosures, so we'll move on to everyone's favorite part of the meeting. Of course, that's the mayor's announcements and reports. 
So we start off first with obituaries. Uh, Mary Florence Vitti, mother of Janet Vitti of our IS department passed away and we pass along our condolences to the family. Uh, this week we have a birthday, Councillor Peter Angelo. It's gonna be a special birthday this Thursday, October the 24th, I understand. Really? That's right. I thought it was in February. Yeah, no, it's not February the 30th. It's Thursday, October the 24th. So happy birthday in advance, Councillor. Federal election announcements. Uh, we'd like to congratulate Tony Baldinelli, who's our new MP. It takes a lot to put yourself out there in the public. Uh, well done to all who ran in our riding and who wanted to represent the people of our community, including our very own Mike Strange, city councilor, who ran as an independent, uh, which is a very, very tough uh, battle to get into. But uh, just the same, we admire what you did and we acknowledge and selfishly we're glad to have you back here. Well, that's what I was going to say. I said I, I was a little disappointed but then I found out, I was a little upset that I found out all the councillors told all their supporters not to vote for me because they wanted me back here. So. <laughs> that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. How did you know? Congratulations also to the federal government and Prime Minister Trudeau with his minority government. Also big thank you to our longtime representative Rob Nicholson for his many years of service to our community. Uh, Lou Ferrigno, um, we were uh, excited to have him in town, and I'm glad we've got a lot of our firefighters here. We had uh, uh, Lou Ferrigno, of course, the Incredible Hulk. We remember from the 70s and 80s, Friday nights, and he would uh, put on the show and rip his shirts, and uh, every kid wanted to look like Lou Ferrigno. And uh, so we had him in town where our chief made him an honorary firefighter, and chief, I think that's the first time he's become an honorary fighter. Is that right, <coughs> firefighter? That's correct. <laughs> All right. He, st he uh, saw the, the light and came from the police to the good side of the fire station. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I talked to Lou when he was down and he said he would challenge the chief at our XKO for kids boxing event. Oh, that'd be a fair fight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Lou Frigno brought a uh, message of anti-bullying. We want to thank Councillor uh, Dabrowski, who part of his Comic-Con event uh, has become friends with Lou Frigno and brought him to the schools, brought him to the fire department, and that was uh, great. Thank you for that, Councillor. The 16th annual Sleep Cheap Charities Reap is underway. Reservations are now open as of Wednesday, October the 9th. You can go on the city's website to inquire. That's niagarafalls.ca. You can stay, uh, stay over. Dates are November the 10th through the 14th of this year where you can stay for 45 bucks and get a great room overlooking the falls. 100% of the money stays in local charities. Councillor Peter Angelo is the chair of annual Sleep Cheap's event and he created a pass called the Wonder Falls Pass, which is on sale now, $10 for 10 attractions. Is that right? Amazing deal. For 10 bucks, you get 10 attractions, major attractions, 30 bucks for a family pass. And those passes are available at City Hall, the Gale Center, the McBain Center and the Niagara Falls History Museum. And again, the dates for Sleep Cheap are September the 10th through the 14th, where you can stay at all the amazing hotels in Niagara Falls. Uh, just go on the city's website for availability, niagarafalls.ca. November. November, I'm sorry, the 10th through the 14th. Thank you for that catch. Uh, also, ladies and gentlemen, we have these Try It tickets. Hopefully, I don't know, is there any camera people here? Okay, good, you got that. Uh, these are tickets for those of you, you're not sure what you want to give away for Halloween and maybe instead, if you don't want to give away candy or chips or whatever the case is, uh, these are passes that you can buy a little book of passes on sale at all city facilities, the Gale Center, City Hall, the McBain Center. And what this is, it's a, a pass that's good for swimming or skating at our arenas. And it's good until March the 31st of 2020. So you can throw it in the, in the bags for the kids trick or treating, or they make great stocking stuffers and uh, somebody you may want to consider. So 10 bucks, you get 40 tickets. So that's cheaper than buying a bag of chips or a box of chips. So buy these at city facilities, get them. There's a limited supply. So get them while you can. 10 bucks for 40 passes. Remembrance Day services are up and coming. Uh, the Chippewa Arena, we're going to have it on Sunday, November the 3rd at the Chippewa Willoughby uh, Arena, and that'll be at 1 p.m. And then the citywide service will be the following day, Monday, I'm sorry, the following week, Monday, November the 11th at the Gale Center. We've invited all the schools, and that event starts at 10.45 a.m. The Santa Claus Parade, 
right around the corner Sunday, November the 16th at 11 a.m. This will be Victoria Avenue through Queen Street. And of course, we'll be, you'll have an opportunity to meet and greet with Santa himself. Um, we're excited that we can finally announce, and I know today that we do have our uh, Commissioner of Community, of, uh, community Services uh, in the room, uh, Adrian Jugley, because we have a great uh, announcement here for Council that Ian DeYoung, uh, who is an expert on homelessness and these types of matters in communities, will be making a presentation in the city Thursday, December the 19th at the Scotiabank Con uh, Convention Center. And for people that are interested, the region will be sending out invites. There will be a regional list if you'd like to come to this event, uh, you can get some more details. Uh, and again, that's Thursday, December the 19th at 8.30 a.m. at the Scotiabank Convention Center. Councillor Ainoni. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, if you could spell his name out yeah. for people, because he has a YouTube channel, and I was able to watch the sessions that you attended last on the Friday. He has his sessions posted from different cities and different viewpoints, and yeah. it's, it's very, wow, does he ever turn the way you think upside down. Yes. But all, all his talks, and, and, diff, and he does the little vignettes on, on information, it, but spelling his name is odd. Yes. So if you could spell it out, people could Google him and watch his YouTube channel. I thought you were complimenting me on how well I pronounced it. So I got that one right, but I will spell it. Yeah, it's, but you don't even know how to spell the first name. No. Well, no, I actually do. Yeah. Ian is I-A-I-N, and De Young is D-E-J-O-N-G. And I want to thank Adrian because Adrian, who's in the audience here tonight, she uh, made this available for uh, some of us at the region. And I was absolutely uh, blown away, as were all of us, that this person uh, is an expert in this field all throughout North America and other places yeah. in the world. And we're going to have an opportunity where everybody can come and hear him and hear firsthand and share. Uh, this is going to turn what we've been doing on its side. And it's going to be a, a new approach that can actually take us in the right direction. So we're all excited. So again, Thursday, December the 19th, 8.30 a.m. So please mark it down. Um, this is gonna be a very special event and then we'll get you more details as we get closer, how you can get uh, on the list, the regional list, so you, that you can attend as well. I'd like to thank council representation, uh, recently by Councilor Peter Angelo representing the city as a guest on your TV with Carrie Zafiro to discuss this year's Sleep Cheap and Wonder Falls Pass initiative. Also, Councillor Strange for representing the city at the TD Green Space Tree Planting, and Councillor Campbell representing the city at the Greetings at the United Way Elimination Draw Dinner. The next council meeting will be Tuesday, November the 12th. So, we will move along to presentations and reports. Uh, and again, for presentations, reminders to all speaker that there is a five minute maximum for your presentation, followed up by whatever questions that council may have. So item 6.1, for those of you following along in your agendas, the Seniors Advisory Committee, goals and priorities, and I'd like to invite up Wendy McPherson. Is Wendy <coughs> McPherson here? Yes, great. She's the chairperson for the Seniors Advisory Committee, and she's gonna make a brief presentation to council. Good evening, Your Worship and members of council. My name is Wendy McPherson. I'm the chair of the newly formed Seniors Advisory Committee for the city. And I had a seniors moment and <laughs> left my presentation at home. Uh -oh. <laughs> so if you'll give me one second to find my notes, I, I'm going to wing it. No problem, take your time. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Seniors Advisory Committee. We're made up of eight volunteers from the community, um, two council members, uh, two support staff, one person from the um, Accessibility Committee, and one staff person <coughs> from Parks and Rec or Rec and Leisure, I'm sorry, I don't have that written down, what are titles? Rec and Culture. Rec and Culture, sorry. Um, I volunteered for this committee because I've spent my whole professional life 
or most of it anyway, working in healthcare with seniors. And I felt that this was a good place to, uh, when I retired, it was a good place to use my knowledge and background. And I like to advocate for seniors. We, the committee started meeting in February of this year and we had several meetings that were sort of the forming, norming, storming sessions that every new committee has. So we had some educational sessions, we got to know each other, and then people started feeling that we needed more direction. So in the summer, we had two um, strategic planning meetings. We hired someone to help us with it, and we set goals and, and objectives for this committee. And you can tell I'm technically challenged as well. Um, so um, the reason I'm here tonight is to present the goals and objectives. The first goal that we um, established was to promote awareness and, and encourage input from the community. We're representing the 27% of the community. Oh, thank you. That's much better, it's easier to read too. We're representing the 20,000 some seniors in the city and we, that's approximately 20% of the population. So our first goal was to create, create awareness and, and get input from these people. And what we plan to do, we have developed a business card, we have a website on, this, on the city website, we, we have a location. Um, we're planning to go out, we're developing questions for um, the committee to ask. So the members of the committee are going out and they're going to ask these standard questions. Everyone will use the same ones. And, um, and get input from the, the people, the seniors of Niagara Falls. Um, we, we're developing posters and we're developing um, uh, a survey for people. We're also looking into where we should do it so that we're all going to the same places, not just randomly. Um, we're, we're looking to see what's affecting people in this community. So, and then we can come back to the council with recommendations once we've done this. So we're planning to start in 2020, in the new year, and spend the year going out asking the population. We want to get a significant sample of the population. And once we've done that, then we will develop a report. Our second goal is to, um, I think yours are different than mine, so I'm going to look. Our second goal is to explore and develop partnerships that inform and improve the quality of life for seniors. So our, our committee is looking at who will partner with us, who has similar goals. We're still working on developing uh, a list. The third goal is to develop an action-oriented strategy focused on older adults to create an age-friendly Niagara Falls. So this we'll do by doing a self-assessment for the city. We're looking at tools right now and that is planned to be done over the next two years. The fourth goal is to advise council. So when we get some accomplishments, we will be coming back to report to council. Uh, we do have one accomplishment that <coughs> we our original discussions were about seniors and free bus passes. And I believe Councillor Wayne Campbell brought that to you and it was voted in and it was started in um, September as a trial for three months. And um, I don't have the exact numbers, but it's over a thousand bus passes have been um, given out at the um, Coronation Center. And in the year 2018, there were 
under 50 bus passes. So there's been a significant increase and I'm hoping that council will um, take this if we have a regional transportation system developed, if and when it develops. Um, I'm hoping that council will take that to the, this regional planning so that everyone in the region of Niagara is able to, act, everyone over 65 is able to access the bus system. Um, we've had feedback that it, people are quite happy with it and using it, so, but time will tell. We have to wait a little bit longer. There has been a report submitted to council for approval of our goals and objectives. And um, and I guess since I haven't got my six pages of notes, <laughs> I think that's about all I have to present. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Thank you very, very <coughs> much. I uh, did very well. <laughs> Thanks. I just uh, want to say that uh, thank you. it was an interesting procedure from the beginning to move forward with the seniors committee and it really has gelled. Councillor Dabrowski and I are uh, trying to get there as often as we can, but uh, I think in the big picture, this is gonna be a really strong committee. I'll move the motion. Okay, that's great. Uh, we've got a motion by, uh, let me just pull it up here. Motion by Councillor Campbell, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski. The council approved the goals and priorities for the seniors advisory committee. We'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now the next item up, it's a report on homelessness in Niagara. I'm going to ask Mr. Herlovich if he could just maybe introduce it, introduce it to the council. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, Director of Community Services, Adrian Jugley, is here if we have any specific questions, not to... Um, do the report with us. So, um, Mr. Hilovich, if you'd like to. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, uh, in August of this year, council received a presentation and asked for staff to report back on alternatives for shelter um, for the homeless in, in order to be able to sleep. The, um, and for the benefit of, of everyone, homelessness is defined as being <coughs> anyone who's living without stable, permanent, appropriate housing or an immediate prospect or means or ability to acquire it. And so uh, region-wide, uh, this has been a, been a growing problem. Um, in the past five years, there's been an 81% increase in homelessness. So if people have observed uh, the situation, it is because uh, the situation has been expanding. The uh, region did a place and time count last March, or March of 2018 rather, um, they recorded at least 625 people who were uh, living without uh, shelter. Uh, there were uh, 22 houses that were uh, classified as chronically um, homeless and 16% who were episodically homeless. So they would be um, without a home at least three times during the 12-month uh, uh, period. And that there are further 60 uh, homes that were taking advantage of emergency shelters of uh, between 100 and 170 days. That's basically up to a half a year as living within an emergency shelter. Um, there are various groups in town which do provide um, shelter facilities. The YWCA, uh, the Boys and Girls Club provides uh, emergency shelter and transitional shelter for those up to thir individuals up to 30 years of age. And then uh, the Project Share provides a um, referrals for emergency shelter and then of course operated the cities out of the cold program uh, last year and we'll be doing so again uh, this year. Um, the, uh, there was a suggestion at the August meeting that perhaps we could use a city park as a place to uh, uh, allow homeless to shelter. Uh, however, um, through consultation has determined that intentional tent cities are not recommended practice for uh, supporting homeless people. The parks are unsupervised. Uh, they're not, uh, they don't have the necessary sanitary facilities. Uh, there could be liability uh, issues and certainly there are um, issues when the, when the uh, sh 
parks are not successful and uh, um, evacuation of the site is necessary. Uh, the staff looked at various municipal facilities, so rather than just... One sec, uh, just on that one point, Mr. Hovich, yes. uh, Councilor Iannone wanted to address the part about the parks, I believe. Sure. Yeah. What, what Angela Peebles was here asking for last time was not a shelter. She did not want it in the park shelter. She wanted somewhere for somebody to lie down and be able to... ...summer. And it's interesting because I was going... We go to parks. I walk my dogs in almost every park. You can have young people out there lying in the sun, beautifully, sound asleep with their hands behind their heads, sound asleep and nobody moves them. They're sunning. They're enjoying the park. But if you have a homeless man who looks decisively homeless, lying in the same park, sound asleep, they get moved along. It happens. All she wanted was somewhere they moved along. Because for the most part, they're not sleeping at night because they're afraid to sleep at night, so they're trying just to catch a few winks here and there in the day. This is overdoing what it was she asked for. She just wanted somewhere that they could sleep on the mats that are being made now. We have, we have a good amount of people making now those milk bag mats that, pe that they brought in and showed that night. We don't want a shelter in a park. We just want somewhere that they're not moved if they close their eyes and go to sleep. Not causing a problem, not doing drugs in a park, just close their eyes and go to sleep. Thank you. Okay. The, yep. Do you yeah, continue? Yes. It, well, you know, and that carries an inherent risk, which is the best thing, basically, what <coughs> the report outlines to council. Um, the we're going to let him just finish his presentation. Um, the uh, it, so, you know, if if they were looking for a shelter, I understand they weren't looking for a shelter, but you know, whatever. Um, you know, there's bedding to consider, laundry facilities, janitorial facilities. So rather than um, reinventing the wheel, it's been suggested that A, we, um, we set aside um, some monies during the, the municipal budget process to look at um, what we can do in order to help support uh, the homelessness. Uh, situation to work with the region who's basically about to go on their next um, RFP, the, re the request for proposals for, uh, for facilities. And it's not just facilities, it, it also includes um, the supervision of those facilities, uh, the, the training of volunteers, and all of the other elements that the region provides in terms of uh, its facilities. Uh, they do estimate that it's going to cost $800,000 region-wide to provide in 2020 the exact same level of services that they provided in 2019. So um, as our situation is worsening, um, the amount of money is not growing. And so that we're also recommending then that this council petition the uh, provincial um, and federal governments to do more in terms of uh, providing um, funding to the region of Niagara to support uh, the uh, target of reducing homelessness. And so those are basically the three recommendations of the report, that we work with the region to secure appropriate safe shelter, that council set aside uh, a portion of the budget deliberations to uh, assist with the <coughs> process of um, ending or reducing homelessness, and that uh, we petition the upper tier governments uh, for funding towards the region's situation. Thank you for that, Mr. Hilovich. I've got Councillor Iannone. Well, I would make a motion that that be approved, but I think we also have to address, I sit on the library board. I know how problematic it's become at that corner with people falling asleep on library property, um, numerous other issues, but there has to be somewhere where our chronically homeless can safely just lie down and go to sleep he said we're not look, they're not looking for any of the amenities that Mr. Herlovich <coughs> spoke about. She was just asking, is there a legal place that she, somebody can lie down and close their eyes and not be moved by the police or city staff? I just think it's a simp it costs us nothing. It's just do we educate people that, hey, if they're not causing any problems and they're lying down there. I took a towel, my doodle, lied down <laughs> in a park and read for an hour and nobody moved us but I watched a homeless guy get moved. There's, 
that, that's very telling. So is there just somewhere that we, they can lie down and go to sleep? And, and I want to congratulate the city because we have our, our homeless leaving the shelter at 7 o'clock in the morning, going to McBain and showering at McBain, which they never had an opportunity to do before. The first year we ran the shelter, we were trying to get them in to shower anywhere, and now they're able to get to McBain. And later on, I'll bring a motion because Councillor Lococo and I had an opportunity to go talk to transit, and they're being released at 7 o'clock in the morning. There is nowhere to go at 7 o'clock in the morning. They can, sh they can shower at 8.30. There's no direct bus from the shower to the Gale Center from St. Andrew's Church. So they're walking in freezing cold weather, um, sometimes blizzards, if they, lucky if they have coats, to Gale to have a shower, which gives them a sense of dignity. But we're looking, we're, we're gonna bring back, a, or maybe I'll make a motion now and ask staff if they could bring back a report on what it would cost to use TransCab. Why don't we first deal with this? Okay, and then I'll bring this up afterwards. So okay. I made a motion to approve this report, but it did not solve the issue that Ms. Peebles was here before. Right. Okay, so we've got a motion by Councillor Ioni, seconded by Councillor Lococo. Did you want to speak to it? Yes. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I agree with the report, and thank you so much, Mr. Hrnovich, for putting it together. Um, the only other thing that I would add is if we're looking at bu budget deliberations for 2020, we really need to look at our strategic priorities because housing, homelessness, and drug crisis is not in our priorities. So I would add that it be strategic priorities first and then budget. Um, adding the homelessness, okay, so we haven't done our strategic priorities list yet. So is that not jumping ahead of ourselves because we haven't sat down as a council to establish them? I understand that. Sorry, I have a cough drop in my, in my mouth or I'm gonna start coughing. Most, most businesses look at their strategic priorities first to figure out what we want to do, what's acceptable, and then you look at your budget, how do you accomplish that? To me, looking at the budget first and doing strategic priorities is I normally would way. agree with you, but this isn't normal. And we've always done it that way in the past. And this time around, we're waiting from the province to deliberate on what our future will be because it's not our decision, it's not in our hands. So that would be jumping ahead of the gun. So I'm gonna make a suggestion that we just follow with the recommendation and we're gonna deal with our strategic priorities. We're supposed to hear by the end of November and then we can deal with them. But to guess what they're gonna do and to piecemeal our strategic initiatives, I don't think it's a good direction of this council. So unless other councillors wanna weigh in on how we wanna handle this, I think we're, this here, I think it puts it to the budget, whether it's a priority or not, if it's a motion of council of a recommendation, it's gonna get dealt with. Whether it's a priority or not, that doesn't change this. Okay, I, I do agree with that. Uh, how do we know how much money to put towards this if we haven't put a strategic priority in place? Well, I, even with a strategic priority, they're general in nature. Yeah, there's no money numbers on any of it. They're general, and then we, boil them down to get to where we want to go. So that's why it just gives direction to staff and then we'll fine tune that. That's why I think at this point, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves and I think we're gonna need a lot of help with Ms. Jugley uh, and Alex is gonna have to work and with all of our 22 partners throughout the region, we're gonna have to come up with some numbers. I don't know what those numbers are yet. I just think this is a big move for the city that we're actually putting it in the budget that we're moving in this direction. I think this is a, I think it's a good move. <coughs> Oh, okay, I, I will add that whatever we put towards this, that we do talk with the region to make sure that the money is being implemented in, in a way that they see fit, because you can throw money at anything, and mm -hmm. unless it's for the right things or the right way, I just want to ensure that the money's being used to accomplish the goal. Okay. Thank uh, you. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. Do we have any? Yes, Councillor uh, Campbell. Uh, excuse me, if I may. Your Worship, uh, I mentioned it in the back room, but the Homeless Committee uh, had a presentation last week from uh, Adrian, and uh, we've come to realize that homelessness can be treated as a stream, if I can use that analogy. There's this young guy standing on the edge of the stream, and some young kid is floating down and help, 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 and he jumps in and he helps that child. Turns around, and there's two more kids there and he's got out and he's bringing the kids in back in and all of a sudden there's a crowd gathering saying what the heck's going on and all of a sudden all these kids come down the river and everybody's jumping in the water and and trying to save this and somebody in the background says why don't we go upstream and see what the problem is and the committee has committed itself 
to follow and support the recommendations of the region and we're going to deal with the upstream to the best of our ability. That's and great. I think what this motion does, it, it puts that forward. <coughs> well, that's great, I, that's a great analogy. Do we have any other comments of council? Okay, seeing none, let's call the vote on the three recommendations. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. Thank you for that. Councilor Ainone. So we still haven't addressed Ms. Peebles' request on, mm. is there somewhere? So we, the city's become far more accommodating to the homelessness and, and drug addiction issues that we have here. Is there some sort of unofficial um, policy we can put out to our staff that says if they're not bothering anybody, you know, they're not actively doing drugs, if they're lying with their head on a backpack sleeping, I don't mean in the middle of Queen Street, but in a park and they're not being problematic, do you just leave them. Unless there's an issue, unless there's a problem, this is, this is what we're, this is, it's as simple as that. Well, I'm gonna ask our, our legal and our CAO to maybe comment, and I think, I think where Alex was going with this is, if they condone a specific location, perhaps we inherit liability for that. Whereas, I don't know our staff, if our staff are asking people to move when they're in a park, I don't know what's happening, but I'm hoping maybe we can get, not that we're gonna solve this here, in this room tonight, but maybe if the CAO or the solicitor can help me on this one on direction for council, we wanna do the right thing, but we want to do the right thing in the right way. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the after, I believe I was requested at a previous time, the homeless meeting, the, this issue about the homeless in the parks had come up to do a little bit of research on, on the legalities of that. So I think your comment that uh, the uh, if we provide a space for them, we assume liability is quite correct. But uh, there is case law, and I'm, I'm just being honest, I haven't finished my research on this, but there is, certainly is case law that there, that came out of BC where they had the 10 cities, um, that the city was not able to prevent people from sleeping in parks if there was not shelter space available. If there were shelter space available, then they could prevent. So that was, that's, as far as I've got, I'm not saying it's complete, so I don't want to get too many questions about it, but that's, uh, that's one line of cases. Okay, so, so you're still doing your research on that? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Councilor, I know. And I've read that research, and we have four tent cities right now in Niagara Falls. They already have somewhere to sleep through the day. We're talking about those that are not living in a tent city. Just, and I think the problem started at the, at the library on the corner. So I think it's just using discretion and a little bit of... Um, tact and giving dignity. If there's no problem and they're not creating an issue, you don't want them sound asleep at the corner of the library, but if they're found somewhere sleeping somewhere else where they feel safe, we shouldn't be touching anybody. That's just, give them some dignity. So we're gonna look forward to uh, getting some information back. Will that be part of, uh, Mr. CAO, part of uh, some information for us? Mr. Mayor, I'm hoping as we're moving forward and we're getting council more educated, these kind of issues become more clear to us. I know Adrian and the gentleman you're going to hear at the convention center, they're going to have other solutions that they're going to bring to the table. I can tell you, I don't believe that any staff, senior staff has given direction to any of our staff to move an individual along in the park that was laying in the park. I mean, I know we've had an individual or two laying out on front of City Hall. Uh, you know, it's it's something that we've not uh, we've not moved them along. I think the problem, if you look at the library, is that when you start to get a congregation of people, and the front of the library is not a park, um, you know, there are members of the public that start to get a little bit more anxious when there's a gathering. But one-off individuals in a few parks here and there, I don't think our staff has been the ones that have been moving along. In fact, I'm not even aware that we're moving single individuals along any of the parks. They may be in the more common areas like a Victoria Avenue or Murray Hill or in front of the library, which really aren't appropriate uh, gathering spots. Um, um, and I think you can see that at the library on the corner, but a uh, indiv few individuals here and there lying in our parks. I don't think we've been uh, 
trying to move them along, and, and we will not give that instruction to our staff now either. Yep. So the follow-up motion I was going to make is they're releasing, the shelter opens next week, or maybe the week after. Um, they're being released at 7 o'clock in the morning. There is no transportation from St. Andrews to uh, McBain, no, Gale, so yep. that they can have a shower. Um, so I'm at, we'd like staff, trans staff, to bring back a report on what it would cost to use a trans cab to just take the handful of people who actually do go and use the showers to Gale so that they're not walking in blizzard or very bad conditions over there. Okay. So I'd like to make a motion Council for that. Okay. Motion by Councilor Iannone, second by Councilor Campbell, that staff come back with a report on a trans cab or other means of getting people from and the shelter. There is no bus. You, the, yeah, uh, you can't get there from here. Yeah. It's really. Yep. Uh, from the shelter to the Gale Center. Yeah. We'll call that. If there's any discussion of that, if not, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. All right. Thank you for that, and thank you, Adrian, for being here. Um, moving along to the planning matters, uh, we have PBD 2019-65. This is regarding a vacant parcel. So I'm going to ask the city clerk to introduce this next item on the agenda. Public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw and a draft plan of vacant land condominium to permit 16 townhouse dwellings uh, on a vacant parcel between 7154 Adams Avenue and 6680 Hawkins Street. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on Friday, September 27, 2019 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the draft plan of vacant land condominium and the zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process if applicable or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal with regards to the zoning bylaw amendment only shall leave their name on the sign in sheets outside the council chamber. Thank you very much Mr. Clerk. I now ask our director of planning Mr. Herlovich if he would please explain the purpose and reason for the proposed draft plan and zoning bylaw amendment. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, uh, the application is a, uh, a request for a rezoning and a uh, vacant land condominium application uh, for property on the south side of Hawkins Street, uh, immediately east of Adams uh, Avenue. The um, property is uh, highlighted in blue on, on the map. Um, to the north uh, west of the site is the Oakwood Gospel Church. Um, to the um, north, west, and east of the property uh, are single family dwellings. In the general vicinity along McLeod Road, there are apartment buildings, um, both three stories and four stories. The, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, uh, council previously had uh, seen a proposal by Habitat for Humanity, which had uh, 18 units on the property. They were, uh, the application was deferred in order to give Habitat an opportunity to go back, revise its design to come back with a uh, fewer units and a lower density uh, than had been presented, uh, I believe it was at the August meeting. Uh, so Habitat did uh, redesign their, their application uh, and they reduced the number of units by two, so from 18 down to 16. I um, don't know if it's clear on the map, but basically they would be creating vacant lots, so each of these units would be sitting on its own lot, and then there are common elements along the back, landscaping, the driveway in and out, and the, uh, the park, uh, guest parking as well. So in uh, requesting the site-specific R4 zone, looking for a, um, a site-specific modification for lot frontage of 15.2 meters. Uh, they're proposing a landscape strip on either side of the driveway um, and the city is, uh, staff is recommending that that landscape strip be wider on the east side next to the uh, single detached dwelling and they're recommending 5.5 meters. And the uh, proposal is uh, that rather than one half the building height that the interior side yards be set at three meters for the west side and 1.6 meters for the uh, east side. Um, we feel that this is reasonable given that a side yard setback for a single detached house on the lot would be 1.2 meters, <coughs> so three meters and 1.69 meters 
both exceed that requirement that if it was to be a single detached dwelling. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, application is for a vacant land condominium uh, for 16 units on uh, a third of an acre, as well as looking for a site-specific R4 zone. We did have a second neighborhood uh, open house. Uh, there was, um, um, uh, what does it tell me there? There were 16 area residents who, um, who attended that meeting. They did express concerns about uh, vehicles leaving the site would shine uh, their headlights into the uh, house across the street on Hawkins that there were concerns about insufficient capacity in the sanitary sewers. Uh, we did check with municipal work staff. There are um, separated uh, sanitary and storm sewers in this area, and there is uh, adequate capacity uh, in this, the sewers. We also checked to see whether or not there were any complaints or reports of uh, sewage backup in basements, and we had no uh, record of complaints uh, in this neighborhood. The um, the residents were concerned about the timelines for construction. The development would most likely be uh, completed in three phases. There are three blocks of townhouses, so it's necessary to construct the foundation uh, for each of those blocks simultaneously. And then the, uh, there was a concern that there were, the site was originally designed for six lots. Um, we investigated that and determined that um, four lots on Adams were excessively deep. So the rears of those lots became part of this property. When there was a property on McLeod Road that had a deep lot, uh, the back of it had at one time been transferred to a property on Hawkins, and ultimately from Hawkins to uh, this project. And then there was a lot, um, a full lot, in a plan of subdivision facing onto Hawkins, which forms the driveway access to the site. So there were not six complete lots, they were parts of lots uh, that basically have been amalgamated over time and form the subject lands. Uh, there was concern about uh, garbage collection that would aggravate a rat problem in the area. Again, we checked with municipal works. Uh, there were no complaints of rats. No one took advantage of uh, our rodent uh, rebate program, and we had not baited any uh, sewers in this area. So there doesn't seem to be um, a concern from that perspective, but garbage collection pads will be provided uh, for this development and uh, residents would place their garbage there on garbage pickup day. Um, and uh, there were concerns just about the future occupants of the project. Um, staff in reviewing this application found that the development does comply with provincial policies with respect to intensification in the built up area. The regional policy plan uh, also supports higher density in the urban areas and uh, it supports uh, growth that contributes to overall supply of housing that's um, suited to the needs of a variety of house, households and income groups. The, uh, looking at our own Niagara Falls official plan, um, the, uh, we have a requirement that seeks 40% uh, of our new housing to be uh, as intensification within the built boundaries. Uh, this would uh, help in, uh, in achieving that number. The uh, lands are designated residential in this uh, city's official plan. <coughs> Excuse me. And the predominant use of the land is to be for dwelling units catering to a wide range uh, of uh, households, and in fact, uh, includes street townhouses. The official plan um, promotes a density between 20 units per hectare and 40 units per hectare, and this uh, development lands right in the middle at about 32 units per hectare so it is in compliance with the city's official plan. And looking at the zoning, the requested R4 zoning, um, with the uh, site-specific recommendations, the ones that I reviewed with you, the reduced lot frontage, that's what they have, uh, the two side yard setbacks, and then the additional uh, lands landscape strip along the driveway. Uh, previously, uh, there was a reduction, asked for a reduction in parking, that has been resolved. Uh, there was uh, further uh, setbacks requirements that were have all been uh, addressed so they have addressed those aspects uh, as I've reported the infrastructure can support the development the reduced lot frontage to 15.2 meters uh, can be supported as it uh, reflects the uh, current configuration and we have uh, provided for landscape strips um, and typically a two-story dwelling I already mentioned this 
has a side yard setback of 1.2 meters and the uh, 3 meters on the west and 1.6 on the east um, both exceed those standards. The, uh, looking at the vacant land condominium, this will uh, um, assist in uh, meeting the city's required short-term housing supply. So we're supposed to have a supply of land available to meet housing needs for a three-year period that's mandated by the province. Um, the uh, design has been reduced from 18 units to 16. Uh, the realignment of the driveway provides for landscaping on either side. The staff is recommending a 5.5 meter landscape strip on the east side of the driveway. Uh, the visitor parking uh, has been improved from the pre previous plan. There's a garbage collection area uh, established and the conditions of draft plan approval will uh, assist in uh, having the development um, uh, occur as it's uh, been outlined to you. Uh, therefore, the recommendation of staff is that council support or approve the zoning bylaw amendment uh, and that the uh, uh, support the 16-unit uh, townhouse development subject to the um, um, regulations outlined in the report. Those are the highlights. Thank you very much, Mr. Hurlovich. Do we have any questions of council for Mr. Hurlovich? Okay. Seeing none, members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the local planning appeal tribunal dismissing any referral that it receives. Failure, failure to sign the sign-in sheets will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed draft plan and bylaw amendment. Is there anyone here other than the applicant who wishes to address council on this matter? All right, if you'd like to step to the microphone. Uh, yep, one at a time, yep, okay. Well, sir, if you'd like to come first. Sir, if you'd like to come first. Is there, who else do we have? Do we have some other people? Can you just show your hand, whoever wants to speak to this? Can you just raise your hand? I guess you're the only one. <laughs> So you're the first, you're the first and the last. So if you can just state your name and your address, please. Sure. Uh, Frank DeLuca, 4341 Kilman Place, Niagara Falls, Ontario, L2E 6P3. Um, before I do my presentation, I understand I do have five minutes. I just want to correct a couple things, uh, very minor in nature, but they do um, make a, quite a bit of effect. Uh, there are. Uh, Quite a few references to the size of the uh, site. It is not one. It's not one five. It's five one. So it's half and half a hectare. Because if it was one point one five, we'd be looking at about six units. So at the max. So I wanted to correct that statement. Also in the executive summary. Can I just before you move on, Mr. Levich? Can we just uh, verify? Yeah, is that okay? So we're good. I'll check with and see whether I have that information, but. Um, Anyway, I, I will confirm the, uh, the acreage, but it's still 16 units. Okay, thank you. And, um, and, and just to make a brief statement before I start my presentation is that um, Habitat's a private developer, and private developers should be accorded the same, um, what I would consider the same things as uh, anyone else. And uh, to make a statement about Habitat and selling to families is just kind of adding to it, and it doesn't make it any different. So one of the things that's suggested here is that units are sold at market value. That's not true. Okay, so when the statement's made in here in an executive summary and it's done by the city, I just ask that uh, that not be in there because it's not a true statement. Okay, we'll get that verified when uh, Habitat comes up here. Thank you. I'm getting very good at this. Okay, so um, just to clarify is that um, not only were we asked to do a lower density, um, 
they were, Habitat was asked to work with the neighbors. And that's one thing that didn't happen. And now we've come to a, a different presentation with uh, making the actual situation worse. So I'm going to go through that. And here are some of the comments that were made, and I watched the video again. Councilor Cario saying it just doesn't fit. I wouldn't want this in my area. Councilor Strange saying, come back with a compromise. Well, this is definitely not a compromise. There will be safety issues. The safety issues are still there. It's not a good fit, and it's still not a good fit. Councilor Thompson said McLeod Road was a better solution, which I much agree with him. And this, this project is overdone substantially. And there's problems with access and reduction, and I wouldn't like to be there. Now I'm gonna review everything that we've talked about before. It is unfair to change the rules in the middle of the game. It's unfair to staff to call you not to put an appeal. It's unfair for staff to delay our FOI until after the meeting. It is unfair that staff argue on behalf of the developer with you in meetings. Staff doesn't punish a developer for a year of uncut grass. They cut the grass once this year, haven't cut it again. Staff don't punish the church for having a parking non-compliance. Still has that parking non-compliance and it's getting worse. And I will go through that in my presentation. Also, staff breaches my privacy, gives information to the developers so they can do their presentation. That's unfair. Developer misleads LPAT with an 18 townhouse drawing that never showed up until an LPAT meeting. Developer withholds information from the Committee of Adjustment. The developer doesn't follow the rules, doesn't have a complete application. The developer has their own open house to sway residents. Truly an unethical contravention of the planning process. The developer uses affordable housing to gain favor. It's affordable home ownership. I think it's a great idea, but it's not affordable housing. So here's my famous document. You look at number one. That's my uncle's house who's behind me, uh, Santo Paulo. That roadway considered my uncle's house to be a corner lot. You just devalued his house by $25,000. You've also invaded his privacy in the back, which is number two, where there's an area. Now he's got uh, now a landscape buffer of 5.5 meters. It's still an invasion of his privacy. And you ruined his garden. None of that has come out from Habitat, and Habitat has no desire to compensate my uncle for that situation. Go to number. So this becomes what we consider called ingenuous, uh, sorry, injurious uh, affection. And here is what injurious affection is. It's market value. It's affected the market value of my uncle's house. It's, uh, it's going to make damages attributable to the disturbance because they're going to be in this for six or seven years. Let's be honest with ourselves. Habitat does two houses a year. There is no charity in the Niagara region that can double their, their efforts and do four if they, if they consider that charities can do about 10% more than what they're doing. So 10% more, we're going to be in it for six or seven years. And they could promise to you, but what the promise would be, what if they don't deliver? Now, I, I want to warn people before I show this diagram is not to stare right into it. Or Mr. Johnson, who lives right across the street, has to, has to see that now even further onto his property because now it's moved to his, all the whole front of his house for eight seconds. And I've been talking for eight seconds, and that goes right into his, they did not make one effort to fix that. And in fact, they made it worse by increasing the buffer. When this development, if this development ever comes to fruition, 5A, 5B, 5C, 5D, those are five parking spots that those people lose in front of their houses because of this development. So we got to ask ourselves this question. Let's try, but let's get a little bit quick here. Number six, and I, I touched on it briefly, it's in regards to the, uh, the suggestion that it would uh, take three years. Um, and you'll see a petition and you'll see a, 
letter from Dan, uh, Janice Pelche asking it to be one year. That's all we're asking, one year. And it's not gonna happen in one year. And would you want to have construction two years, three years, four years, dust? Covers, that garden is gone in the second year. Now, let's analyze this project against the four tests defined in the section 45 of the Planning Act. Does the proposal maintain the general intent and purpose of the official plan? No. Here's your official plan. Applications for draft plan approval and subdivisions shall include a housing mix, varying lot sizes, housing forms and unit size, and the development of targets for affordable housing. Now I do understand the last one, that you are in the process of developing targets for affordable housing, but they're not there right now. Second test, does the proposal maintain the general intent and purpose of the zoning bylaw? No. Ooh. Minimum lot frontage for a townhouse dwelling is 30 meters. This is 15 meters. So now, let's go back to a proposal you had a second to last council meeting, and it's about Marinelli Drive. We were arguing here about over five feet, and you went back to the, the developer and asked them to come up with the development five more feet. This is asking you to, if you want this approved, is 25 foot lots. Let's see if you were to go to the people that live on Lucia Drive and Marinelli <coughs> Drive and ask them that, to accept 25 foot lots. It's the same example. This is the proper, uh, and I think this should be adopted by the city in regards to how you define density. There's a large road in there that should be uh, added to the, uh, deleted from the calculation, and it should be the minimum, or the minimum, medium should be 12. We're suggesting eight because we want the minimum. Here is an example, three examples of what a, a hectare of land looks like when you try to shove in so many. This is on street, which has no road calculation. This is when you have a road leading into it. This is what 32, which is 16, for that would be that development. Look how crowded those <coughs> townhouses are and continue to be uh, crowded in that, look, in that application. Look what 40 looked like without the road. Nice and big, nice and wide, and big gaps in between each one of them. Now, this is what we'd like to see. 12 units, four threeplexes, a 100 foot frontage in front of here, moving the road here. If this was the application, we wouldn't have lots to stand on. We couldn't go to LPAT with that. And that's the, it, the more interesting aspect of this, is that this is what I'm gathering from LPAT decisions. They use the provincial policy statement in all of their stuff, and you can't go against the provincial policy statement. And here's a statement from it. These land use patterns must promote a mix of housing, including affordable housing. Not all affordable housing, including affordable housing. And to go further with that, the ministry is making changes. They, under the new regulations, they are to mandate the amount of units used in housing developments to create mixed unit communities. The, the, the municipalities will have the flexibility to decide the number of units, and this will apply to developments of 10 or more. So that's what the future holds. Is the proposal minor? Heck no. The extent of the impact of this proposed development on neighboring properties and the neighborhood as a, as a whole are major. The mass and height of this proposed development will create significant issues for abutting property owners related to the loss of privacy, parking spaces, traffic restrictions, and views. The proposed density of the development is quadruple that of any established norms of the neighborhood. The proposed development would create negative impacts related to access, parking, drainage, safety, and noise. The proposed development is not compatible with the established built forms and the character of the neighborhood and serves to be one off or an anomaly among the thousands of one and a half story homes. 
Now, the statement I want to make here is the provincial policy statement again, which is from an LPAC decision. Avoiding significant or sensitive resources in areas which may pose a risk to public health and safety. Well, here are them all. And you have a letter in there from uh, Mr. Johnson who is stating some of these, and I'll go over them with you. Number seven is 80 feet. You have two driveways and two roads. Uh, a safety hazard just waiting to happen. This is my uncle's driveway, number eight. He has to look four ways to get out of his driveway. By the time, he, and my uncle and Mr. Johnson aren't, aren't young anymore. By the time they look four ways on their, um, on their driveway, there's going to be an accident. Both of them have to look four ways. They have to look at this driveway and such as that. Number 10, the width of that driveway, it just goes right into Mr. Johnson's driveway. You can't move it any further than that. You move it five feet this way, look, the, the lights shine further into his house, even worse situation. And then we get back to number 11, one of my favorites. Oh, that got this. Oakwood Gospel Hall. We've had this uh, discussion very few times, uh, a lot of times, and I miscalculated. I thought that they required 40. They require 49 parking spots. They have less than 18, and legal 18. They have a maximum seating capacity of 246. <coughs> that requires them 49 sites. But wait, there's more. They have a full basement with the same square footage used for get-togethers and rent for parties. And my friends behind here can tell you some of the get-togethers they have because it spills out into the whole neighborhood. <coughs> this is where the Niagara Falls official plan can help us out. Where legal non-conforming uses such as this seriously affect the amenity of the surrounding area and the possibility of proving such conditions will be considered, especially when the public health and welfare are directly affected. In such situations, council may be requested to consider the feasibility of acquiring the property, concern, and holding, selling, leasing, or redeveloping in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act. Special attention will be given to the possibility of reestablishing the use in conformity with the policies of your plan, and it says this plan. This is, they showed you part, I'll show you the full picture. The X marks the spot where you want to put habitat. The driveway goes out here onto Hawkins and it's 15 meters. This is Bruce Apartments, has a road, a city road that goes into it and has at least 100 foot frontage on the McLeod. B is the Ontario Housing Corporation, has 100 feet of frontage goes onto McLeod Road, right next to that pro property. <coughs> C is the Bellagio, a beautiful um, <coughs> the development, and it has 100 foot frontage. Last year, I believe you approved, and it's building right now, uh, right beside the Rex Hotel, a beautiful de condo development, 100 foot frontage on the McLeod Road. The only different one is this one, but look at all the, of the thousands of one and a half story behind here. What's the problem? This one right here. Now, unfortunately, I'm not really good at this, so I've skipped over a couple, but I just want to go back to my, I have lots of slides. We're about to wrap up though. Yeah, I got, I got one more good slide mm -hmm. and then, but, but I just want to just review the slides because we're going to, I could talk about bonusing. I could talk about subsidized housing. I could talk about all the things, what's wrong with what's going on here, but I just want to leave you with this one because this is the one where I, you know, tonight is October 22nd. This is the development which is um, Habitat for Humanity. And tonight you can have 13 different opportunities for illegal Airbnbs in this area. One's attached to the site. So you have to solve that problem. This is not a problem for this neighborhood. I'm only asking is that if you want to put 14 in one area, it's a, it, sorry, 16 in one area, it's a mistake. If you want to put a couple in the area and put, like Mr. Continelli is doing tonight, 
He'll show you a development in regards to that. Beautiful. 100 feet frontage, beautiful home, big, no corner lots. He's created that. Those particular situations are exactly what I think you should have. And I want to go back to one thing about flag lots, which this is one. There are none in Niagara Falls. This will be the first flag lot in Niagara Falls. And what flag lots do is the properties in front of it, devalue it. And this is the example that the staff tried to use. This is O'Neill Street, 30 meters, beautiful houses, two houses on there. They bought the backyards of six neighbors and built a nice subdivision in behind those houses. And it was built to wonderful standards. You're going to use the example of Alvey Properties, which uh, uh, has 100 foot frontage and has 19 units. And I think Michael Allen will do a wonderful job on this one. And this was the Continelli property that you're going to see tonight. Again, exact same as the O'Neill Street properties, more than 100 feet, this is about 62 meters frontage, and it has 30 units. But look how big these units are. Look how big these units are. We will have two records. We'll have one. We'll have the smallest frontage, and we'll have the, the smallest frontage in regards to the actual six meters uh, for um, habitat properties. Six meters is actually the size, almost the size of the driveways of these developments. So I just wanted to show you those examples. I just wanted you an opportunity to go through this and talk about LPAT, and I am always available for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions of council for Mr. Bunker? Okay, I think we're good. Thank you for that. So is there, I, I'm assuming there's not, but is there anyone else other than the developer who wishes to speak to this? And who here is also uh, part of this group that's opposing this? Could you just raise your hand so we can see? Okay, we got a few in there. Okay, thank you for that. Council will now hear from the applicant or his or her applicant, or uh, his or her representative rather. Good evening, uh, everyone. There's a presentation, I believe, that you have uh, on the desktop. That's the cover page, Mr. Clerk. Yep, thank you. Well, uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, staff, and those uh, in attendance. Uh, my name is Craig Rowe. Um, I'm with Upper Canada Consultants and the agent for the file. I'm, I'm a senior planner with the, uh, with the company. I'm also a registered professional planner. Uh, my intention this evening is to highlight some of the modifications that have been made to the plan in response to the previous public meeting, open houses, and then to provide a final, uh, final position from our client uh, pertaining to consideration of these applications for draft plan of vacant land condominium and zoning bylaw amendment. And just as a point of clarity that I wanted to provide to council um, with regard to Mr. DeLuca's presentation, a lot of the tests he was leading you through uh, were under section 45 of the Planning Act, which pertain to minor variances. This is a um, application for a draft uh, plan of vacant land condominium under section 53 and the zoning bylaw amendment is also a different process so of course those are good tests to weigh development against but they are not applicable tests that govern this decision so i just wanted to provide that so uh, on the screen now is the original plan that was considered by council um, on august 13 2019 the original plan contained 18 units i believe there's a mouse here if i can uh, 18 units so this included 16 townhomes here and then two additional units in the form of a semi-detached dwelling. Um, the density of this was 35.5 units per hectare. Um, and the zoning amendment was requested. Um, right now, the zoning line on the property is here. This is R4 and everything else is R1C. We're requesting, we requested to rezone the entire property as R4 with site-specific provisions uh, that included uh, semi-detached dwellings being permitted uses and any site-specific provisions uh, required to implement them. Reduced frontage reflecting the existing condition along Hawkins Street. Reduced interior side yard setbacks for the sides of the uh, townhome units. 
in this area and in this area. And then a parking reduction by one space. We were under by one. Um, so some of the co comments that were offered by councillors uh, included concerns about density, access to the site, screening of the parking, and walkability. So this is a revised plan. I'll just I'll animate that again just so you can uh, see the transition here. So that's the original. And then this is where we've arrived right now. So uh, this is the uh, revised plan, which now shows a reduction in two units, specifically through the reduction of the semi-detached dwelling that would have previously been located here. Um, I want to be very clear that this reduction was not an easy choice for our client. Um, with the cumulative effect of now two families uh, do not have a, a place to live coming up. So um, it stings quite a bit for our client. So I just wanted to pass that, that message forward. Um, with the reduction of the semi-detached dwelling, the number of site-specific provisions required have been drastically reduced um, to only apply for the existing deficient frontage as well as the interior side yard setbacks. So all of those additional provisions uh, related to parking, and everything to implement the site specific um, for the semi-detached dwelling, those are now gone. So it's a very uh, small set of site specific provisions and one, as I mentioned, is an existing condition. Um, we've addressed the concerns about the parallel parking. So if you'll recall on the first one, let's go back here. This was the original parking, six spots parallel along the driveway. So we've addressed that by bringing the uh, parking spaces internal to the property. Um, and also providing one more spot so now we do comply and exceed the minimum requirement of the zoning bylaw. Uh, the removal of the parallel parking also allows uh, more opportunities for landscaping on either side of the throat of the driveway there uh, and to incorporate more trees and screening between properties. Um, a new sidewalk has also been included which would uh, come off Hawkins Street and along the side here and then carries through on one side of the development. We had some room to include that. Um, because there were some concerns from council about walkability, people walking down the driveway, kids riding bikes. Um, so we were able to include that and we're, we're very happy with that, with that addition. Um, one of the net impacts too is that we've also been able, and with regard to the director of planning indicated a minimum 5.5 .5 meter uh, landscape buffer. So that would be the grass area and the sidewalk. This was the drawing that was originally discussed at the open house. Um, and further to that, we do agree and uh, we would consent to an increase of 5.5 meters from the property line to the back of curb over here to increase that screening against 6680 um, Hawkins Street. So with regard to that additional open house, um, it was held at the McBain Center on uh, September 4th, and I believe we had 16 people that were signed in. Um, we provided the city uh, shortly after the council meeting with a revised plan with some, some edits. We consulted with Habitat for Humanity on that, and edits we felt that were feasible and still work for them to, to move their project forward. Um, at the event, uh, I, I came forward. It was moderated by the director of planning and provided an overview of some of the changes, kind of like I'm doing right now, uh, and then opened up to any questions that they had for me as well as any staff clarifications that were requested us. Habitat for Humanity was there as well. Uh, so some of the, uh, some of the changes that, that we have here, oop, there we go. Yeah. So those were the, the changes that I, that I highlighted previously. But with regard to that, that public meeting, um, the following concerns um, came forward again, and these were some of the things you previously heard about the existing frontage. Um, the existing frontage on this property is a legally established entity. Um, the relief we're asking is strictly to reflect something that exists. So um, we don't feel it would be fair to decline that requested provision because it is a, it's an existing condition and it's the only access that we do have onto Hawkins Street. Um, with regards to density, um, originally when our concept came in, our density was 35.5 hect uh, units per hectare, uh, which falls within the city's official plan range of 20 to 40 units per hectare. Through this change, we're now down to 31.5 units per hectare. So again, we still conform, but we have been able to reduce that. Um, in terms of traffic, there are, the, the traffic concerns were brought up that really deal with the yield signs in the neighborhood and the perceptions of the traffic that flows through that area, um, uncomfortable situations that feel, people feel they're in. Um, my comment back to that was the fact that this is an existing situation. There's nothing constructed right now and these issues exist. Um, our our uh, casual suggestion was, you know, perhaps with the implementation of this development or maybe on its own consideration of, of switching to a stop sign at, uh, I think it believes Permella and um, uh, Hawkins Street, so that something that the, the city could uh, take a look on. Um, but regards to traffic concerns for this, um, city staff has been clear from the very beginning as well as Niagara Region, no traffic concerns, no parking concerns with the development. Um, there are questions about waste collection and how the uh, truck turns around. It very simply comes into the T does a three-point turn and leaves, we need collection paths because a regional garbage truck can't go more than 15 meters. Um, 
it can't back up more than 15 meters. So we have those collection pads, same as our original concept. Um, there was a challenge about the uh, con concept that the lots were not legally established. Um, we have Sarah Premi here uh, from Sullivan uh, Manning on behalf of Tom Richardson, who's on vacation right now. And um, we had some correspondence back and forth and provided that information to uh, the director of planning confirming that the subject lands were lawfully established. They have a survey boundary and they're registered in land titles. So it is indeed a legal lot. Uh, and then the final concern we heard was about this water and sewer capacity, which was new to us, but as the director of planning um, highlighted on, uh, there's no issues in the area. And uh, we submitted a functional servicing report to that same effect when we made our application. So in terms of our final positions, um, the, the applications together provide a much needed opportunity to tackle housing issues within the municipality and Niagara. Housing is a council priority, and this development offers an immediate opportunity for those who need a helping hand to have a home. As noted, removing units from the plan was a difficult decision, but in the interest of moving such an important project forward and addressing the comments put forward by council and the neighbors, we feel that the revised plan is a fair compromise. From a planning perspective, the plan conforms and meets the intent of provincial, regional, and local land use planning policies. The position is echoed in the recommendation report prepared by city staff that remains supportive of these applications and recommends approval. Some of the concerns related to uh, site lighting, drainage, landscaping, and other technical design matters can be addressed through the detailed design process, which will be to the satisfaction of city staff, council, and the review agencies. So in closing, we believe that these applications should be approved by council. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any additional questions uh, you may have, or if you do have questions for Habitat for Humanity, um, Mark Carl and Keith Gowans are here with me as well. Thank you very much. How do you say your last name? Uh, Roe. Roe, okay. Yep. Do we have any questions for Mr. Roe? of council. Uh, Councillor Strange. Yeah, um, when Frank was up here, we just saw some of the comments. One of my comments was, was compromise, and I know some of the residents are here, and I don't know if they were at the public meeting. Was there some compromise um, to come to this here? Was it from their input as well, or was it just you, you showed them this and that was it? Or did you get some compromise from them at all? Um, from the last meeting we had. Certainly. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to the Councillor. Um, we prepared the plan. We needed uh, something to submit um, that we felt we could have a, a proper discussion on. Um, we have professional planners and engineers that do this work in consultation with our client. Um, Habitat for Humanity is a developer, as we heard, uh, and they have a mandate to provide this housing to the folks that need it. So we put forward the best plan we felt possible that addressed the most concerns, uh, and we felt it was the highest and best um, use of that property. Um, in my opinion, the comments we heard, um, they were things that, that really couldn't be addressed, like acquiring property along the cloud road and changing entrances around, as uh, we confirmed with the waste collection, the water, these are all non-issues. So um, myself and, and the Habitat team, we didn't hear anything that we could do besides remove more units, which isn't feasible, uh, given the cost of land and uh, the development that's trying to move forward. Um, in, in their business model. We can't keep cutting. Um, there are suggestions to move to a subdivision model, which we can't do, because we can't fit a public right-of-way in there. Um, and the, the bigger these units get, we, we run out of land, and then it's, uh, it's astronomical cost to bring in the water, the sewer, the hydro, the gas. Um, it becomes not feasible anymore. Okay, uh, I've got a question. They, they, it was mentioned that the units are not sold at market value. I don't know if that's questions for you, or that's gonna be for uh, Mark, Carl? Yep. Okay, all right, thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, when our units are completed, uh, we have a licensed appraiser. So same as a bank or any mortgage company, come out and appraise the unit. Uh, it appraises the neighborhood, looks you know, through what would a house similar to that sell in the neighborhood. Uh, that is what establishes our mortgage. Um, so they're appraised at market value. The price that the individuals, that the families buy the house is at market value. What is difference it's, that makes it affordable home ownership is the mortgage model. Uh, we don't charge a down payment and we charge 0% interest. And we only charge for property taxes and principal what 30% uh, of their income. So every year the families submit their income levels and we adjust the mortgage and all the money that they basically pay on principal goes down on the principal that helps them pay it off quicker, gives them equity in their house. So to answer the question directly, a licensed appraiser has to appraise the house at market value. We sell the house, the mortgage documents that, we sell the house at that. Habitat holds the mortgage, we just charge 0% interest, 
and 0% down to make it affordable. Okay, so they are market value then? That is correct, Mr. Mayor, they are market value. And one of the other concerns that I heard was the timing that this could take several years to build. Uh, is there any um, ability to do this in a year or, or two? Versus six, I'm just wondering uh, sure. if you have any th thought on that for the residents' concerns. <laughs> sure, and I, I mean, I certainly, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you for the question, understand the concern of the residents. Um, the major amount of work that would be done would be the infrastructure would be done, the roads, the sewers, that would be your, your major heavy lifting type of work, construction work that would be done. The rest would be foundation put in, framing, flooring. Blah, blah. So to answer your question directly, um, I would love to do it in a year. Absolutely, we would love to do it in a year. It would depend on our fundraising. We do build uh, four to five houses a year now, four houses a year roughly. We'd be looking at doing six a year, so it would take us roughly two and a half to three years to do that project. I'm just being realistic. Uh, we fundraise the money. We uh, look for community donations. We look for corporate sponsorships to help us build our houses, and that's how, and then carrying forward some of the mortgage money and restore money. So to answer your question, we roughly, with fundraising and that, we could see building you know, five to six a year. Uh, it would take us two and a half to three years. I, I just can't sit here and I couldn't tell you any sooner. I, I don't think that would be fair of me. If there was a whack of money and a whack of money that came down to us and fundraised and corporations got behind us, absolutely we would do it in a year. But realistically in our business plan, it's gonna be three years. Project okay. so. Thank you for that. Uh, any other questions of council for the applicants? Uh, Councilor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> Earlier, I talked about downstream and upstream. Yes. To you, would you consider this an upstream that, solution? That we're going upstream to solve the problem? Yes. 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 We're giving. And, and it, go ahead. I was not aware of how they operate. Zero percent um, geared to, uh, mortgage or geared to income. The problem with homelessness now is the people that are gonna move into a facility like this, they're going to open up spots that they have been previously taken, and some of those people that have been on the street perhaps or in, in a shelter will now be able to get up to where they should be, and they'll be able to receive regional services, uh, medical services, and such. So I can't help but think that and I understand the problems that exist with the neighbors, but um, they, they've compromised and, and I can't help but think that this is a really good upstream. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And we, we are proud of the, the lives that change in our families and homes, and especially the second generation. You see the children that go off to university and school and do really well in school and, and really have a, a foundation. You know, we always believe if you give a, a roof and an education to a, to a child, you change their life. Now, you, you guys just built one on 4th Ave. We're, we're building it, yes. We're currently doing it, yes. Yeah, how, how long did it take? After you've got the uh, foundation in, how long did it take you to, to build the walls? Uh, a couple of days, a few days. I think Keith, uh, if I could answer, look at Keith, our operations, uh, Chief Operations uh, Officer. Yeah, uh, uh, three days. Three days. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I went down and had a look at it, and it blew me away. And if you're going to do the same thing here, I, I have a clear idea of what you're building, and I think it's going to be great. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, that's the ones with the prefabricated yeah. walls. That yes. Were, yeah. 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 They're uh, they very efficient. They're uh, you know just to save money for the families long term. So yeah. they're prefabricated and insulated. Thank you for that. Uh, did I have any other questions or comments of council before I close this public meeting? Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The public meeting with respect to the proposed draft plan of vacant land condominium and zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. What is the direction of Council? Councilor Iannone? Moved by Councilor Iannone to move the recommendation. Do we have a seconder for that motion? Seconded by Councilor Campbell. Do we have any discussion to the motion? Councilor Pierangelo. Your Worship, I just wanted to make a couple comments. Uh, I guess. Um, I understand, uh, you know, Habitat for Humanity is a very good organization, but I also think that um, the residents do deserve some, some input. I, I think the whole application got off to a rocky start when it showed up at Committee of Adjustments, and, uh, uh, you know, they were um, assembling land, and um, whether there was no information available or no information that was uh, forthcoming, the residents had asked questions at that point, 
you know, what's going on, and then there was no information. So that, I think, kind of led to uh, the rocky start, Your Worship. And I know that, um, again, I'll go back to Habitat for Humanity, is a good community organization. And there's a little community that lives around this development as well. And, you know, it, it, it's unfortunate in a sense that there wasn't more of a buy-in from both sides. And I think if they would have got off to a better start, then there would have been that buy-in. Uh, I know the residents would like to see um, the development to be less dense. Um, and I understand that, you know, Habitat doesn't want to, uh, I guess, bend on the density uh, that they have proposed. Um, this one is a little bit different, though, Your Worship, because, I mean, uh, when you own a piece of property and you have someone's backyard in your backyard, you, you don't you generally anticipate that that's ever going to be a development. I think it's different when there's a, a vacant piece of land that sits there for 30 years and someone comes down to complain about an application and you kind of look at them and you say, well, you knew it was going to be something one day. But when it's someone's backyard, um, you don't typically think that way. You don't think that they're going to turn their backyard into uh, group multiple housing. So I uh, just wish that it would have got off to um, a better start. And uh, I wish that it would have been uh, a little bit less than your worship. Thank you for that. Any other comments of council? Okay, seeing none, so we have a motion by Councillor Iannone, second by Councillor Campbell, that we move the recommendation. All those in favor? Okay, one, two, three, opposed? Okay, hold on a sec, let's try this again. All those in favor? One, two, three, four, all those opposed? One, two, three, four, all vote in favor. So the, uh, it's approved. Okay. Thank you for that. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Yes. <laughs> if I can make a point of clarification, uh, the opening invitation at the part, sorry, the meeting you said uh, people should uh, sign the sign-in sheets in order to be able to appeal. There was a change in the Planning Act, and so a plan of subdivision or condominium, the only person that can now appeal would be the developer. The public can't appeal that, but the zoning, any member of the public could appeal. Okay, so you're saying that everyone needs to sign in? Well, everybody will sign in, but the, they won't have the right to appeal the condominium plan. So if they go to LPAT, as a result of council's action, the, uh, it's only, they can only appeal the zoning. Okay, yeah, we're gonna have the clerk, is he gonna speak to that? So just in my opening preamble, I did add in the line uh, when speaking about the appeal that it was with regards to the zoning bylaw amendment only. Okay. Okay, thank you for everyone that came out for that matter. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, can you please introduce the next item on the agenda? Public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to permit a 32 unit townhouse development at 6353 Carlton Avenue. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on Monday, September 23rd, 2019 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the zoning bylaw amendment or would like to preserve their opportunity to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets that are located outside the council chamber. Thank you very much. I'd now ask our director of planning, Mr. Hurlovich, to explain the purpose and reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Uh, thank you, Worship. This property is uh, located on the west side of Carleton at the end of Ash Street. Uh, it's the area that was formerly the uh, Rainbow Greenhouses. Uh, site people probably remember it uh, as that the uh, so the properties outlined in, or highlighted in blue there are detached dwellings to the uh, to the west to the south and to the east of this particular property uh, the far north is uh, a portion of the AG bridge uh, park the uh, proposal before you tonight is uh, to develop uh, the site as a vacant land condominium and to, uh, to rezone uh, the property for, uh, for townhouse units. So there are in total uh, six blocks of townhouses proposed. 
Uh, they are seeking uh, an R4 um, zoning and then they're looking for a number of site specific uh, provisions. So an interior side yard width on the north side next to AG Bridge Park and on the south side next to the ex existing uh, residential lots that uh, front onto ash uh, with a side yard of two meters rather than one half the building height. Um, the privacy yard at the, uh, on the rear on the west side, which is the left of your screen, uh, they're seeking a 7.5 meter setback. This is exactly the same setback that would be required for a detached dwelling. Uh, they're looking for a maximum lot coverage of 43.2% overall on the site. And then, <coughs> excuse me, uh, building number three, uh, for the two units that back onto one of the houses on Ash, um, they're seeking a 6.3 meter setback. The balance of that block has in excess of 7.5. And then for buildings one and two, they're seeking a setback of 6.5 meters uh, behind those for the privacy or amenity areas. Uh, and the, that again, if that was a side yard of a lot for a single family, those would be 1.2 meter so requirements. And they're looking for a, uh, a front yard depth of six meters, which uh, would maintain the, uh, the um, streetscape along, uh, along Carleton, where the single detached dwellings that currently exist are uh, set back from the, uh, from the street itself. The, um, so again, they're seeking a site-specific R4 zone, changing that from an R1C uh, single detached zone. The, uh, we did have a neighborhood meeting in September uh, the uh, eight residents that came out were concerned about uh, the traffic on the street and the ability for the street to carry the traffic. Uh, our traffic and parking uh, section has reported that the road capacity can carry a thousand cars daily and there is capacity. The uh, requested um, that there be an eight foot long perimeter, perimeter fence uh, and the applicant is willing to install such a fence that would be the maximum allowed under our uh, fence bylaw. Um, they uh, asked about protecting uh, existing mature trees on the site. That would be to the extent uh, possible, uh, but it may not be possible in every situation. And then um, they were concerned about <coughs> sufficient capacity in the sewers to accommodate uh, the additional flows that would be generated by this uh, development. The, um, in looking at this application, the planning staff found that uh, the proposal does comply with the provincial policy statement and growth plan that is an efficient use of underutilized <coughs> lands in our urban boundaries. They looked at the official plan. The lands are designated for uh, dwelling units, uh, providing for a wide range of households. The proposal is within the density um, between 20 and 40 units a hectare. They have 29 units per hectare. Uh, this will assist the city in meeting its 40% intensification target and the existing infrastructure can support uh, the proposed development. A servicing uh, design brief will be required at the time of site plan approval uh, and, and or as a condition of condominium approval. The um, zoning is, um, as I outlined, looking for six meter front yard setback uh, from Carleton, a 7.5 meter setback on the west side six and a half meters setback for buildings one and two, um, and a 6.3 meter setback for a portion of building three. And then interior side yard <coughs> for buildings three, four, and six, uh, they're proposing two meters, whereas 1.2 meters uh, would be allowed for a detached dwelling. <coughs> and uh, the uh, requested zoning will provide appropriate regulations for the form of development uh, within this established neighborhood. Therefore, staff is recommending approval of the zoning bylaw amendment uh, to change the zoning from an R1C to an R4 to allow the 32 unit townhouse development and subject to the uh, conditions outlined in the report. Thank you, Mr. Hurlovich. Do we have any questions for Mr. Hurlovich? Okay, seeing none, members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at the public meeting will result and the local planning appeal tribunal dismissing any referral that it receives. Failure to sign the sign-in sheet will result in the staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant. 
Is there anyone here who wishes to address council on this proposal other than the applicant? All right, seeing none, council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, city staff, uh, uh, we believe uh, the uh, director of planning's report is a fair representation of the uh, process. Uh, uh, we had worked closely with the residences and city staff uh, to accommodate some of the wishes, to loosen up the plan, and uh, we have nothing more to add. Uh, I'll welcome any questions. If, uh, any questions have. of council for Mr. Raimondo? Okay, I think we're good. Thank you. All right, the public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Councillor Thompson makes the motion, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski. Anyone want to speak to the motion? Seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. So thank you for coming out. Moving along, our planning agenda, I'd ask our clerk, Mr. Madsen, please introduce the next item on the agenda. Public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed plan of vacant land condominium at 6894 Garner Road. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on Friday, September 27th, 2019, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of council's decision shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets outside the council chamber. As mentioned earlier this evening, the public are no longer able to appeal a plan of vacant land condominium as per recent uh, passing of Bill <coughs> 108. I'll ask our Director of Planning, Mr. Herlovich, if he would please explain the purpose of the application. Thank you, Worship. This application is for um, to uh, a vacant land plan of condominium uh, for a parcel of land on the uh, east side of Garner Road, immediately south of Black Walnut Drive. The uh, property is uh, uh, surrounded by single family houses to the north, east, and south. And on the opposite side of Garner Road, uh, our agricultural land uses Garner Road is the urban boundary in this location. The uh, vacant land uh, of condominium is proposed for the sale of seven townhouse dwellings. Uh, the property was rezoned in 2018 as a residential low density multiple group dwellings, uh, which was designed to accommodate this form of development. <coughs> so excuse me, the uh, site itself, the driveway is on the uh, south side of the property. And if I can get the cursor to work for it. Um, so there are two uh, visitor parking spaces here at the far east end of the driveway. And then there are seven uh, townhouse lots and the townhouses uh, would be erected on those uh, particular properties. Um, we looked at the official plan, um, or excuse me, the policy statement and the places to grow. Um, sound like a stuck record, but again, this uh, helps achieve the intensification of the built up area. The city's official plan um, uh, has, this property has a density of 34 units per hectare between the 20 and 40 units per hectare recommended. And the zoning uh, complies, uh, the development complies with the zoning that was put in place uh, last year. And it would form an appropriate regulations for this form of development. The vacant uh, land condominium, um, the uh, conditions outlined in the uh, report will ensure that development occurs as being presented here tonight. There is a condition that there be a wood fence uh, to screen the adjacent detached dwellings. There are two uh, visitor parking spaces um, in addition to the uh, driveway and garages that provide parking for the units. And uh, the condominium development will assist in meeting our short-term uh, housing supply needs. Uh, therefore, staff is recommending that the vacant land uh, condominium be uh, draft approved subject conditions in the report that the mayor and or his designate be allowed to uh, sign uh, the draft plan uh, 20 days provided that there are no appeals and that the draft plan be given for three years uh, after which the approval will lapse unless council extends that and then lastly that the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute the condominium agreement 
um, and any required <coughs> documents for the future registration of the plan of sub subdivision. Uh, so those are the highlights of this application. Thank you very much, Mr. Hillovich. Any questions for Mr. Hillovich? Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the plan of vacant land condominium. Is there anyone here other than the applicant who wishes to address council? Yeah, if you'd just like to come to the microphone, state your name and your address, please. Okay. My name is Guy Plouffe, and I live at uh, 8952 uh, Black Forest Crescent, okay. which is right next door to where this project is going to be. Um, we had a couple of meetings in the past. I can't recall the date, but uh, at both of those meetings, we had an issue, or the issue of, of drainage had been brought up. I'd just like to know if that was ever resolved. We never heard back from City Council on, on that issue. Um, as well as the parking, can you clarify uh, how many parking spaces you're going to have or you're going to provide? And uh, I guess our concern, of course, is that the parking lot would be filled fairly quickly for the townhouse uh, owners and residents and then people, the traffic would start to follow and, and back on to Black Forest Crescent. That's our main issue. Okay, are those your two concerns? Um, <clears throat> right now, yes. Okay, we'll get you answers when the applicant comes up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else other than the applicant who wishes to address council on this matter? <coughs> All right, seeing none, we'll now have the applicant or his or her representative address council. Good evening, worship members of council. Um, I'm going to address the two comments you just heard. Um, on the issue of parking, we do meet the parking requirements under your zoning bylaw, so we're not asking for any variances. Um, the second issue being drainage, it is a condition of draft plan approval that there be a grading plan submitted by an engineer, approved by your engineering department. So if there is a current issue, this development will resolve that issue. Okay, great. Okay. I'm here to answer any other questions you have. Otherwise, <laughs> uh, the distinction between this application and the last two is that we already have the zoning in place. We're simply here for the draft plan of condo. Um, which, as you can see, has a whole host of conditions, and this development's not going to proceed unless we meet all those conditions. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any uh, comments or questions of council for Mr. Baca? Okay, I guess we're good. Thank you. The public meeting with respect to the proposed plan of vacant land condominium is now concluded. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Thompson. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you very much. And sir, we've got you your answers, so the parking is fine. There's no variance requested for the parking, and as part of this process, any uh, issues regarding uh, drainage will be addressed with a professional engineer, and it'll be rectified. Okay, and it's, so it's been approved. So thank you very much for everyone for coming out for that matter as well. All right, moving along, item... Uh, we go on to reports. Okay, first item, fee waiver applications for the Knights of Columbus and the and project share. What's the will of council? They're asking for waiver for their two fundraising events. Moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Lococo. All those, uh, did you want to speak to that, Councillor? Yeah, Your Worship, just a plug to the Knights of Columbus who are uh, raising money this year, and I believe one of their charities is going to be Heaters Heroes, and they wanted me to mention that. Yeah, that's great, and we should mention that. So the Flying Fathers hockey game is going to be taking place at the Gale Center, and uh, it's I, I'm told it's like the Harlem Globetrotters of hockey. <laughs> so it's supposed to be quite an event. What's that? You're in it. Yeah, I'm not in it. But, um, uh, you know, it's funny. I don't I know if the date. Do we have the date? Uh, does anyone have the date of that event? It's coming up pretty soon. We've got everything in the report, and I'm not sure that I see the actual date. Does anybody know that date? It's in November for sure. Okay, let's just, we're going to look just so we can give it a quick promo here. November the 19th. November the 19th? What day is that? That's a Saturday? You have somebody over there answering? Yes. Oh, 
The, the date of the uh, game is uh, November 9th. 9th? 9th. Okay, is That's that a Saturday? That's what I have in my email. Sunday. And what do you have? <coughs> Pardon me? We have the 19th. We have the 19th. 19th. You have the 9th? <laughs> Tuesday in Niagara Falls. 19th. It is the 19th? Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so let me just check. Yeah, so let me just check. Okay, so let's just go over that one more time because I thought I put it in my calendar as well. So you're saying the 9th or the 19th? 19th. It is the 19th. That's Tuesday. Yes, it is. It is the 19th. That's the date. So Flying Fathers hockey game at the Gale Center. I believe it's 7 p.m. on Tuesday the 19th. You want something fun to do with your kids? You want some real entertainment? You want to watch the Flying Fathers and you can support a good cause as well. So we've got the motion uh, moved by, uh, who made the motion now? Councilor Peter Angelo? Mm -hmm. And seconded by, okay, Councillor Thompson. Who tell me who made the motion? Thompson Lacoco. Thompson Lacoco. Thank you for that. All those in favor? Approved. All right, we're done. We can move along to our fire station, uh, station seven staffing. Uh, we have a report with three recommendations. Councillor Cario makes the motion. Seconded by Councillor Strange. Yes, Councillor Iannone. Thank you very much. I see a lot of our firefighters are here. Glad to see them here tonight. Um, in previous delegations here at Council, we had talked about, or the fire service had talked about how it was important to keep an aerial truck staffed with four, four firefighters. I see in this report it says that, it, that when you move that aerial, it would be staffed with just three. So I'm asking the chief, if we're staffing the aerial truck with just three when we move it, is that putting our firefighters at any increased risk? Chief? Mr. Mayor, through you, uh, yes. I mean, the short answer is yes. It's putting our community and our firefighters at risk. Um, the reason I'm recommending, or the reason the report's the way it's written, is obviously taking into account the impact of the budget. Okay, thank you. Yes, Councillor Inouye. Then, then based on that, is there any other option that we think is possible that we could front end or hire, not more firefighters, but but sooner so that that truck does not get manned with three firefighters, but four. Because I, I, by the very fact that the chief just stood up and said, yes, it's not, it's not safe for our firefighters and not as safe for our community puts us at a liability. So is there not an option that we can front end that so that we make sure it's staffed at four all the time? I'm not asking to hire more over the three years, just quicker. Did you want to comment, Chief? Mr. Mayor, through you, um, yes. Uh, in the report, I indicated that we could hire in 20. So we would actually hire four prior to us opening the station, and then four again in 21. And then it would be four again in 22 or 23. We could, we could gap that one year to uh, save again on the overtime impact. Um, I guess if we were to hire the four in 20, we could use them to augment us with regards to staffing because some of the staff are are off on vacations or we can send them away in training. So it would also have an impact to reducing our overtime budget. Thank you. Councilor Ayanon. I'm sorry, did, was there a motion on the floor? Right. Yes, there is. To move the recommendation, can I make a friendly <coughs> amendment that we follow the chief's recommendation right there where a motion is that we do hire in 2020, so we front end hire as opposed to the the um, schedule sitting before us for 21, 22, and 23? Well, we'll have to ask the mover and the seconder if they consider that a friendly amendment. So, um, Not more, just earlier. But considering what the chief said, I would go along with the, the friendly amendment. The chief has said Thank what you. he said, so I'm not going to go against the chief. Okay. So, and the seconder, you're good with that too? Okay. Anything else? No. Nope. Okay. All those in favor? Okay. That's approved. And item. 8.3, construction of fire station seven. We've got two recommendations. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by <coughs> Councillor Strange. Is there any discussion to the motion? So happy to see this. All those in favor? And that's approved as well. Thanks for coming out, gentlemen. You can stick around, the rest of the meeting will be just as exciting. <laughs> okay, we are on to uh, L2019-21. Three recommendations in regard to um, Uppers Lane between Thorold Town Line and Beechwood Road. What's by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. 
Item 8.5, requesting exemption of two-year waiting period for minor variants. Moved by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? Okay, and it's approved, so we're good. Mr. Vadavas, it's, you've got your two years. Uh, item 8.6, there's proposed telecom facility on Willoughby Drive. There are two recommendations. Uh, one, staff saying they do not concur with the uh, construction of the 30 meter tall monopole and they would reconsider concurrence for the uh, construction of a 30 meter tall monopole style te telecom tower should construction not happen at the Marshall Road Tower. So we have two recommendations of staff basically to not build this tower. Basically Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by uh, Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. So we have a resolution based on a motion that we just made. Um, therefore, we're resolved that we're giving the two, that we're exempting the two year waiting period for the minor variance for Mr. Vadabas to move forward on his C of A. Moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? Okay, and the, that resolution is passed. So thank you for that. Con agenda. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo to move the consent agenda and seconded by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. And let me just check here as we go through it. Uh, 11, communications and comments of the city clerk. Uh, the Greater Niagara Circle Road Committee requested one member. There's a recommendation that Councillor Campbell join the Greater Niagara so Circle Road. Okay, and that's, wow, well, that was moved very fast. <laughs> <laughs> that's only because I wasn't here. <laughs> Okay, so that's a motion by Councillor uh, Cario, seconded by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? All right, that's a unanimous one. 11.2, Vista Pyrotechnics requesting the approval of the annual so New Year's Eve fireworks show at the Skyline. Moved by Councillor uh, Lococo, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? That's approved. Item 11.3, the Niagara Parks Commission obtaining for obtaining their special occasions permit for New Year's Eve. They need the, the event to be declared of municipal significance and that's moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor, that's approved. 11.4, proclamation request, community of St. Agidio request proclamation that November 30th as Cities for Life, Cities Against the Death Penalty. Receive and file, your Okay, receive and file by Councillor Cario, second by Councillor Lococo. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you. Procla proclamation request, Respiratory Therapist Week, October 20th through 26th. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you. Ratification of in camera, Mr. Clerk. A closed meeting was held earlier this <coughs> afternoon where a proposed closing surplus declaration and sale of Uppers Lane and non-open road allowance between Beechwood Road and Thorough Town Line Road was discussed. Uh, the subject lands were considered to be surplus. Moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Lococo. All those in favor? <laughs> That's approved, thank you. And now the bylaws. Yes, Councillor. Um, I forgot to declare a conflict. And it's on bylaw 219-115, uh, the QP agreement. A member of my family is a member of that local. Okay, you got that, uh, Mr. Clerk? Okay, thank you for that. The bylaws, Councilor Peter Angelo? Yep, so motion to introduce them and give them a first, second, and third reading. Okay, motion by Councilor Peter Angelo, second by Councilor Dabrowski that the bylaws be introduced and give, being given a first, second, and third reading. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. And now new business. Yes, Councilor Strange? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, um, earlier we were talking about um, the St. Andrew's Church and um, I guess transporta transporting um, some of the homeless to Gale Center or yep, for showers. For shower. Is there a way that we could fund St. Andrew's Church um, to get a couple of showers there for the homeless? And like, you know, they have to have water hook up and like that, but I think it would just be a simpler solution. It's actually not a bad idea. It might be cheaper than busing them. Um, just before we do, Council, we're going to ask staff <coughs> if we can get some feedback on that. I don't know um, if that'd be Mr. Hillovich or Mr. Todd wants to address that idea. Of yeah, and it, uh, yeah. 
No, that was giving me my point. I, yeah. I, I, you know, a conversation would have to take place. I'm not sure the church wants that or would, okay. would like us to do that, but why don't we have a conversation with uh, Project Share who's heading it up? Um, and we can talk to uh, Diana, Project Share, and perhaps bring a report back at the next meeting. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Councilor, I know. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Strange, for bringing that up. There was a, lo there was a local group, um, Niagara United, who had applied for a grant to have portable showers to help the homeless. They didn't get their grant. They're on the wait list. But I'll bring Council back information. And it shows how a portable um, shower unit that has two units in it the t as much how much water it needs, um, how it moves, what it takes. Um, St. Andrews only has two staffing. They don't have staffing to have people go off, have a shower, have somebody follow them. I know that it gets a little problematic with drug usage because I've had to sit outside of a shower while women were in there showering so that there was no, it was, it was at um, Glengate Alliance. And so that's not, quite workable, but there is portable showers that are being marketed now to help the homeless in, er in areas like that. And I think we sat with Niagara United who called us, it's a great initiative. They just didn't get their funding. So I'm preparing it to bring back to council. Maybe so, just have yeah, a conversation make, with, with the church yeah, and yeah. see if... So motion by Councillor Strange, uh, second. second by Councillor Iononi, that uh, we have the discussion with St. Andrews around this idea. And maybe, if the showers start before seven when they have to leave, maybe they have the showers at six, mm -hmm. well staff are there. And then maybe that might be part of the solution. So that gets into some of the problematic discussions we have on kicking people out at seven o'clock. Because it's pretty hard when you're sleeping in a room with 20 people, A, to sleep well, and then get up, have a very quick breakfast, and then be ousted at seven o'clock into a snowstorm. So getting up at six o'clock to have showers and get them out, and they want them out at seven o'clock, not a minute to, not a minute later. Mm -hmm. So that's become an issue with discussion that we've had amongst board members ourselves. So we're trying to find some sort of other humanely, uh, humane initiative that we can do it. So if you leave at seven, quite often until they can shower at, at Gale, they have an hour and a half to kill, and they're walking to Tim Hortons or to McDonald's or somewhere that or the library somewhere to get shelter so there's a problem with that timing that's i'm just giving you a forewarning that's an issue we, we can ask them yeah. for an extension for half an hour or something yeah or I, I think that's a great idea decision. to have the discussion because yeah. i mean if that could you right rather you know so all right so motion by councillor strange second by councillor iononi all those in favor okay that's approved thank you for that councillor yeah. councillor carrio uh just a quick question mr hurdlebaker who are going to answer it the uh appeal of our uh airbnb bylaw uh, can we get an update on when is it going to be heard or what's, uh, is it in April? I, people were asking me the status yes. of it, what Mr. we're doing. Um, yes, Your Worship. So the, the bed and breakfast portion that council passed last year was approved by the board, but we're waiting for the written decision. I'm not sure they're way behind. They're supposed to provide them within three months. The, uh, meeting was in July or the hearing was in July, we were still waiting. Uh, the vacation rental unit or short-term rentals, that bylaw is scheduled for a two-day hearing in April. I thought the hearing dates start on the 18th. It's either the 8th or the 18th. Of 2020. Of 2020. Yeah, on that point, Councilor. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. And I guess it was brought up because the rumor is out there that the city's bylaw was struck down. So. Um, Maybe we can hear from staff uh, yeah. whether or not this is true because I thought that um, the bylaw that city council passed was simply appealed and that it was uh, at Alpat right now being heard and that it was delayed until next April. Not that the city's bylaw was struck down. So, so maybe we can get a clarification. Either a solicitor or a CEO. <laughs> or just to, uh, as Mr. Hurd okay, of the one, the B and B one has been approved. Been approved. Yes. Um, say the other one's going to hearing. But council should know as well that Mr. Hurlovich and his staff are still actively pursuing prosecutions. So we have a number of prosecutions coming up. So for people out there that think we're doing nothing, um, we aren't, we're getting out there and, and when we can get enough evidence, we're, we're, we're pursuing the prosecution. We're not so waiting. We're not waiting. And I think we, we have a number, I believe, going, uh, I'm not sure the exact date, but very soon. Uh, there's a number that are actually 
uh, going to be before the uh, courts. The courts. Okay. Thank you for that. I've got one too. Is there any other new business? I have a few. Oh, you, oh, oh go ahead. Why don't we just do yours, Sam? Right. Let me sit back. Yeah, oh, comfortable. Uh, you worship under the consent agenda. There was an issue on, I think it was uh, St. John and St. Mark's uh, yeah. traffic control. Mm -hmm. I know that people in the area have been asking for some type of traffic re uh, review, especially the ones on St. James that are dealing with the uh, new development of Wendy's. Um, I mean, there's two, there's two elementary <coughs> schools in the area. As you know, I think your kids were at Notre Dame. Yep. And then there's John Marshall as well that are at, that's, uh, you know, almost within the same block. It can get really busy there. Have we done any type of traffic review um, in the area, I guess? Um, have we looked at the fact that that commercial development is gonna be causing more traffic? That would be my question. Maybe we can ask Mr. Bilodeau if he's got some uh, insight. Yes, of course. Um, I'm actually dealing with the resident right now on this matter. Uh, the last time we studied this area was in 2016. Um, at that time, traffic volumes and traffic speed were suitable, uh, and they were, they were below the threshold that we would consider a problem. Uh, we have acknowledged the residents that once the Wendy's uh, restaurant is built and the traffic normalizes in the area, we're going to be reviewing it again to make sure that there's no uh, undue uh, hardship there or any issues with traffic because of that development. Okay. okay. Thank you so for that. We're going to get something back. Uh, so we'll get something back at what time? Or at what point? Once the development's finished? Yeah, we're so saying. we're going to wait for the development to. Uh, finish and be in operation and then allow it probably for a month or so to normalize, to give into normal operations, and then we can produce a report after that. So likely, you know, first quarter of 2020. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's all yours. No. Half hour. No, no. Okay. Um, all right, Your Worship, the next issue I wanted to talk about was garbage. Um, what happened? Like, yeah. uh, well, let me, I let me mean, answer. they went around to every single municipality. Yeah who pays a separate charge for the service and asked them what they wanted. And I tried to follow every municipality's response and I didn't see any that asked them to go to every two week. And all of a sudden they um, use the environment as their excuse in going to every two week pickup. And you could put out one a week, so basically two every two weeks, and they went to two every two weeks. Um, I'm not sure who the salesman was on that one. Uh, but they're still sending around both trucks every single week, Your Worship. And I know I brought this up before. I guess what annoys me is the fact that the region wanted the service. They wanted to do garbage, and they operated it for a couple of years uh, internally, and then they contracted it out. And at that time, I, 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 I'd said, and I continue to say, well, we can contract it out ourselves. I mean, it's not part of the regional taxation. That's what a lot of people don't understand. It's an actual separate charge. So we actually pay for the full price of uh, garbage collection and I thought that's why the region asked us our opinion is because we're the ones that pay the bill um, but I, I guess they didn't listen to us so uh, I know you got some comments I know you had some comments I know you voted against it so did Councillor uh, Gale, Councillor Nicholson um, we have a rat problem in the city uh, I don't know that I really see this as a, as a great step your worship I know that they're trying to increase the uses uh, the usage of the green bins but um, I, I, I guess uh, <coughs> anything short of expecting that um, rotting produce in people's garbages is going to make them uh, or is going to force them to use the green bins, I mean, I'm, I'm not so sure it's what we want. So I guess my question is, what are our options at this point? Can we go back to, uh, you know, doing it ourselves, putting out our own tender? Um, can we uh, leave the regional umbrella in terms of garbage service? Um, I mean, it's something I would like to explore because I think I know what our baseline level of service should be, and I'd like to provide that. So uh, that's a great uh, question. And uh, yeah, last Thursday we had our council meeting at the region, and uh, yeah, a number of us uh, voted against uh, bi-monthly pickup. Uh, and you're right, they're trying to force people, what they're trying to do is increase their diversion rate, less uh, things going to the landfill, less organics. So what they're trying to do is get people to use their green, green bill, then you're right, by forcing them to store their garbage in their garage for two weeks. And yes, the, the garbage truck that'll pick up the organics will go every week by your house, but they won't pick up your garbage. And I said, could we opt out? The city of Niagara Falls officially voted. They don't want this service. They did surveys around the region. The majority said they don't want uh, bi-monthly, but they're doing it anyway. 
So uh, it's, a, it's a small savings. It's not a major savings. And some have said it's for, in the name of the environment. And it's interesting because what we learned is that methane gas is worse for the environment than CO2. And methane gas comes from organic decomposition. So is it better for the environment? Very questionable. You have trucks that are gonna drive right by your house, and then every two weeks, they're gonna have twice the garbage to pick up. They're gonna have twice the work to do. So is it environmental? I'm sorry, I'm not buying that one. Like you said, I'm not sure what salesman sold that one, but a lot of them are trying to do the right thing. And I said to them, sometimes you try to do the right thing, you do the wrong thing. You inadvertently make a bigger problem. And, and the example I used was when we had to ban texting and driving, which of course, it seems like a good idea to do because people used to drive and text at the steering wheel. Well, what they do now is they text with their phone between their legs. We have more accidents now than we've ever had by far. They call it intoxication. And it's worse than, so you, you, it comes up with a common sense idea, but with a terrible outcome. That's why I said with this one too, I think it's a bad idea. It was a very small savings. And I can't get into specifics of the in-camera part of it, but it was not significant at all. So it's a reduction, and Councillor uh, Nicholson put it right, it's a reduction in service. Make no mistake about it. Then they said, then are we gonna buy more green bins for the people that don't have them? And there was no discussion on that, no decision made, because that would cost more than the savings. Much more than the savings. So. It's like the tail's chasing the, or the, the dog's chasing his tail. And, uh, and again, I mean, it's, the vote's been done. And I asked if we could opt out. And they said, well, no. And I don't know legally if there is any other way around that. But, but definitely I was uh, disappointed with the, with the way it went. And there's a lot of confusion around the, uh, the, the chamber. But, and I, we mentioned we have a rat problem, not just Niagara Falls, around the region. There's a rat problem all over the region. They said, I'm sure this isn't gonna help. And they said, well, then don't put your organics in the garbage. So they're trying to force you to deal with, you know, because if you don't want rats, then don't put organics. It was a little bit of a heavy handed approach, I thought a little strong on approach. So anyway, the vote, it was uh, not a unanimous vote by, by any means, but uh, the vote did pass uh, that it would now go to bi-weekly with the new contract, whenever that happens, some point next year. Did you want to comment to that, Absolutely. Councilor Kerr? Well, yeah, I think you were finished. Well, Your Worship, I'm just wondering, I mean, I wouldn't mind referring it to staff. I know the region kind of gave you the him and ha about whether or not you can opt out, but I think it would be interesting to actually explore the option to decide our own baseline level of service, mm -hmm. and that would be the motion that I would make. Okay. Moved by Councilor Peter Angelo, second by Councilor Caro. Let staff come back with a report. Uh, you caught him? Get more straps, get more traps. So uh, we've got, just before I call that, uh, Councillor Campbell, you want yeah, to? Yes, Your Worship, just uh, in, in addition to that, um, Queen's Park. I, I've noticed in several other cities in uh, parts of the United States that every garbage pickup on an odd or an even day is only on one street. And all the garbage mm -hmm. goes over to the other side of the street on an even day and all the garbage goes over to the other side. And they only have to go down the street once. They don't have to, they're basically saving a lot of time and potentially money. So if, if I could add that to that. Sure, yeah, I mean, if that's something that you want to explore. You worship yeah. a number of years ago. Um, I mean, I guess under that scenario, you would have to literally take your garbage and put it on someone else's property. A number of years ago, I had proposed that uh, one person puts the garbage on the easterly limits of the property, the other person puts it on the west, provided that they can do so, and then there's only one stop for two properties. Each person's garbage stays on their own property. The option was never explored by the region. I even asked them when they were here once. So, I mean, obviously, if that's something that the staff wanted to explore, it would cut the stops, it, it would cut your stops in half. Well, and if you've got 150,000 stops, and you can cut that down. Exactly. Half. That's a huge thing. Exactly. And, and, the and, and the garbage yes. stays on your own property. Right, exactly. Well, that makes an awful lot of sense. Uh, yes, Councilor Kerr? Uh, just a quick comment, Your Worship. I, I spoke with uh, Councilor Peter Angelo about this earlier in the week. I don't want to accept that they can just cut this service that we're paying for for our residents to every other week. I mean, I want to do everything we can do to see if we can get away from the region on this one. We're paying for it anyway. Let's see what that's we right. can do on our own. We're paying the bill. Uh, yeah, we're paying the bill. That's, that's ridiculous that they could do that to us. So what's next? You know, if, if we have to accept this, what's next? What service are they going to cut? And we have no, no say, not a chance. 
Okay, so if there's no further discussion of this, let's call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. Thank you for that. Yeah, of course, continue yeah, I got on. a couple more, Your Worship. Uh, Your Worship, in the paper, there was an article about uh, NEC college students, um, and it was about the international ones, and then uh, it, it talked a lot about, um, I, I guess, their, their stay here in Canada and uh, their educational success, but part of it talked about um, them living uh, long-term in hotel rooms. And I'm just wondering, being the city, um, are we in any way, shape, or form uh, liable now that the article is in the paper? I mean, do they fit under the proper zoning? Um, what are our responsibilities as, as a municipality? That's all. So who would like to answer this between Alex, Donna, and Ken? <laughs> Everybody's looking at their shoes. <laughs> hey, Your Worship, I don't need an answer tonight. I, I, I really don't. I just I wanted to put it out there because the article's in the paper. I mean, it's a public article. So everyone read it. I just wondered if the city had some type of responsibility. Well, we'd be we'd be happy to report back if that's what you're looking okay. for. Yeah, sure. um, you know, I know Mr. Hurlovich can. This is all really wrapped up in, you know, some of the other things we've been doing with Airbnbs and our zoning and what's, you know, so this student issue really gets wrapped up in all of that. And I, I truly believe that, you know, when you start looking at how we're going to solve the homelessness problem and, and fix the housing situation. Uh, the student um, residency problem, I think, has significantly contributed to that. And I think we really should get a handle on it. And, uh, you know, if there's kids living in substandard accommodation, then, you know, I think we have a responsibility to uh, to address the issue. So we'd be happy to report back on okay. it. Okay, I'll also make that motion. Okay, Councilor Einhorn. In that motion, can you also add residential houses? Council Coco and I have been working um, with a number of residents on houses that have the same thing. But I think the, the fine line we walk is, if you're going to go in and do inspections where these young people are living, what happens if you find substandard and where do 400 young people who are here from another country go to live if we shut down that piece of property. So if we're sending our staff in, um, it, I think we have to be very careful that we, it can't be with the, the intent of shutting the place down. Because Grant LaFleche and the Toronto Star wrote a four, four day, uh, what did they call it, uh, expose, and then he was on the radio talking about it. And should that happen, these young people have nowhere to go. And there is no, <coughs> There's no choice for them to go home and having failed. Like there's a whole hierarchy and order there. And we only have a shelter that houses 20 beds. So if, if, we're, if we're starting that now, what happens if we go in and we have to shut it down? I'd hate to think that we have hundreds of students who have eviction coming up shortly. And by the way, they pay ahead of time. Yeah, no, I know. Like, I'm just. I just want I us to be very careful. Eviction. I never mentioned eviction. I never mentioned shutting any place down. I, I don't know how the conversation got there. I simply said, "What are our legal responsibilities?" That's all yeah, I said, yeah. and that's what I would like to know. Yep, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, counselor. Yeah, and I wasn't being critical, Councillor Peter Angelo. I'm saying one thing automatically flows to the next, and that was a part of the article in the paper. Should you go in and move these young people? There's nowhere for them to go. There's no housing. Um, there, we, we dealt with a house that had 35 people, 35 students living in one bungalow that had each room had been turned, each bedroom had been turned into four cubicles. And we would send the city, the city would let them know they were coming, they would move them out the night before. <coughs> the resident sent us videos of them moving these young people out the night before. We would investigate and when our people left, the video shows them moving the young people back into the house. So it's a problem all over the city right now. Councilor Lococo and then Thompson. Quite a few months ago, I was contacted by a real estate agent who was very upset with um, a lot of the foreign students in the hotel rooms. There's a website that's advertised in India for um, re residents to come here and it's four residents per room. They've ripped out the fridge, they've ripped out the stove, They've asked any other residents to leave so they could put four per room, and she was just appalled. So being a real estate agent, she wanted to go out and find a, a house 
for those students and they all pooled their money together. So that was one, one incident. And the other incident was um, a woman who was paying a lot less than the normal market rate. She really wanted to leave that hotel. She felt very unsafe and there was really no place for her to go. Why they want her out of there? Because they want to pull the fridge and the stove out there and put four people in. So they are advertising it in other countries to come to Niagara Falls while you're going to school. Uh, it definitely is a problem. Okay, so uh, did you want to comment too, Councillor? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that okay? <laughs> anyway, if there's anything um, that's uh, um, unsuitable in housing or where anybody's living, you got to call the health department. They're responsible for living conditions. And if you got four people in one bedroom, then that's, inaccept uh, that's unacceptable. So uh, they're the people that you should be dealing with rather than city staff. The other problem we got, which I can't get a final solution, is rooming houses. Um, there's one place uh, with 10 people in single rooms and uh, six, eight cars out on the road and the police visiting steady about problems, fights, uh, drugs, and uh, they're still existing. <coughs> I, I think we have a real problem in dealing. And this is in a single family area next door all the houses and they're complaining steady and yet it just carries on that's something i'd like to have a solution to okay so we'll call the vote on councilor peter and, and councilor carrie will made the second no i'm good no you mean the second i mean oh yeah sure. yeah all those in favor okay that's approved unanimously do you have any more i have one more yeah. of course of course okay. you do yep. uh thanks your worship I, I i i sent all the council a couple pictures and i titled yeah, them before and after yeah and i titled them before and after um it's a lot actually it's in councillor thompson subdivision uh it's on pinestone road anyway um the resident uh the resident uh was charged um for grass cutting and so I sent the photos. Uh, now these photos are the ones that she received from staff. So uh, they're not her own photos. Um, now I, I fully support people who don't cut their grass. You know, the city sends someone out and cut the grass. But have a look at the picture. And the bill sh that she received was over $1,100 um, to cut that piece of grass. Um, so uh, I, I guess it just raises some questions for me, Your Worship. I guess, you know, the first thing that I'm wondering is, um, is there a tender involved? I mean, is this... Uh, Standard fee. Yeah, like, is this contractor that we use tendered out? Um, if so, I mean, I, I, w I wouldn't mind seeing the tender. I'm all for charging someone if they don't cut the grass, but I really want it to be reasonable. Can you get them uh, now, that $1,100 was broken down. I think there was a $300 admin fee and an $814 grass cutting charge. Um, well, Mr. Mayor, this is the first time I'm hearing of this. Be happy no, to and look happy into to, it. If, yep, if, you'd happy send, to uh, if you'd send us the you know, picture, we'd be happy to invest, know, investigate it, but uh, first time I'm hearing of it. Yeah, I'll send them over to you. So, but I guess what he's asking though is, do we do a tender? How do we come up with our grass cutting uh, staff? We, Mr. Mayor, we have tendered it, but I, I I don't know how recently we don't do it every year, but I, I do know that there have been tenders in the past. I, 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 I just I, I, I want to know, Your Worship, that uh, that we are dealing with a current tender, and the reason is is because, um, like I said, I, I think people should be reasonably charged, but I also don't believe, and I'm not saying that that's what happened in this case, um, but whatever the contractor's charge is, the city then has to collect. So I want to make sure that that's reasonable. Uh, perhaps there are extenuating circumstances in this one. I don't know. I'll wait to get some information back from staff. Um, but I would like to pass it over. And I don't know what happens to the resident in the meantime, uh, whether or not the resident should simply pay the bill and see what happens after, or whether there would be a stay on that until it comes back to council. Yeah, a dispute. Did you want to talk on that one, Councillor? Yeah. Is that all right with you? Again? <laughs> 
Last he forgets. Um, yeah. yeah. First of all, uh, he indicated it's in the neighborhood of St. David's where I live with the townhouses. This is the only piece of property that's left that's vacant. It is has not been built on and there's probably three lots, maybe four townhouses that will eventually be built there. And it's uh, completely, um, it's not like somebody's cutting a lawn. And I was dealing with the individual <coughs> who re his mother received the $1,100. And uh, um, the, with some effort, uh, the $300 was cut out of, from the city, but the $800 was for cutting the piece of property. Now, this is not somebody who's going to go and cut the grass in a flat uh, lawn. This was uh, hilly and uh, uh, rocks and everything else in there. And uh, but uh, I still think um, we should, uh, and I've done this many times, look at uh, how much they charge for like $800 uh, is not insignificant. And I think we should uh, look at what's happened in the past with respect to charging for cutting grass because I also agree it's uh, exorbitant. And, uh, uh, but that piece of property is a huge piece of property uh, and it's not level. It's uh, 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 rocks all over it, mm -hmm. uh, piles of uh, uh, debris, and uh, maybe that's why. <coughs> but they did get the city's portion, $300, was cut out. And from what I understand from uh, Gerald Spencer, um, it was sent out, and there was, uh, I don't know whether some death in the family, and the other one didn't get the information, and uh, it uh, finally got into their hands, and it was too <coughs> late, because they were cutting the grass on a regular basis. So, anyway. So did we make a motion? I give up. Yes. Uh, Your Worship, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to make a motion that staff give us a report back. I mean, maybe Councillor Thompson has some details that that I don't, um, I know well, it's a big charge. You know why? I like to say I mean, that. Yeah. I mean, I think we should monitor that. If somebody doesn't cut the grass. I know. Well, we definitely should monitor it, but we should make sure that the charge is reasonable. I mean, we don't even pay our own staff that much money to cut grass, so. Yeah. I don't know why so, we're collecting it. So we'll call the else. vote. So moved by Councillor Peter Angel, seconded by Councillor Thompson, or, okay. No, let's do Councillor Thompson, yeah. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Whew. Did you have any more, Councilor Peter Angel? Did you have any more? You know what? I'm done, Your Worship. Oh. <laughs> Your Worship, I noticed that there's a gentleman in the audience that's waving a flag or something. If anyone's in the audience, usually any people are in there, we would ask if there's something they want. Well, I don't know. I'm just asking. I mean, okay. if was anyone else in the, we'd ask what they're here for or what they want. Okay, we can ask. I mean, I, just ask. Can I? Well, we would ask what you want. Can, can well? I'm not, not, I'm not looking for an hour presentation. You just ask people why you're here, what you want. That what? Sure. There's been a secretary of court decision for him not to speak on his dismissal. Okay, okay, so do you want to, okay, and just before you do, um, the, the one thing we can't discuss, there's one issue we can't discuss. Mr. Clerk, do you want to? Uh, as I emailed counsel uh, back on September 30th, uh, it would not be advisable for Mr. Butera to speak to his request at a council meeting uh, regarding his continued efforts to dispute his dismissal from employment. Uh, he can attend council meetings, but he is, quote, prohibited from attending to make any and all arguments about his continued refusal to accept the outcome of his arbitration and his ongoing effort to obtain what he perceives as redress from the city. This is from Superior Court of Justice. Um, ruling in August of this year. I, I understand clearly that 
after many years of dealing with this issue. Absolutely, I don't want to talk about my employment with the Syrian force. No, that I got to be ashamed of that, but it's best. I want to talk, Honorable Major, about three legal meetings that this council did behind the closed door and the chairman of the meeting was being scary and the decision to expel Carlo Butera for another six for another six years from Syria Council. You are all intelligent people, you should know that the city of Niagara Falls have no right to expel a taxpayer, not even for one day, but 15 years, Mr. Mayor. You have a trash my name to the press, online, to the court. You lie on the court. You lie on the oath. We are married. I can prove. I've been bullied by your staff. Okay. We're you not, don't understand this, English? We're not able, Mr. Butera. We can't deal with this topic here. We already have a. a court I, I want to know why this city of Guinea Force have expelled Carlo Butera for 15 years from attending public parks, arenas, cemeteries, and city hall. The Canadian Charter, Section 2, B, C, and D, said that it is the right of <coughs> Canadian, and I am Canadian proud, yeah. to speak in defense. I don't want to be bullied when I, when Mr. Kerio come to my house, I open my house and treat with respect. When I go to ask him a question, he called the police. Why you call the police? Well, he was the one that, he's the one that asked you to speak. But we can't deal I, with this okay. here. This is not a court. This is a city council. Okay. And this is the, not the right place to be dealing with this. Mr. Diodati. And the court has already told us that we cannot deal with this here. The court have told me, and I got the feeling of the court, where said the two female controllers, their husbands, and the mayor sent a city employee, one run water, to lie. The court, that what say? Okay. The court says that you keep in lie. Yes, I Councilor Kelly. Uh, I want What's to that? only. I, I have one issue of new business, though. That's why I was kind of disappointed. I didn't get a chance to. Uh, Mr. Diodati. That I need to deal with. I that. only want to know why. The Syrian Air Force behind closed door decide to expel me from public meeting for seven years. The yeah. first me the traspass notice was by Kenny Todd. The second by Kenny B. Man. Then by Kenny Todd for six times. And now there is still a prohibition from the police. Who gave the authority to the police? Why you trash my name to the police? Mr. Okay. Diodati, you, okay, Mr. So we're, Thompson, is, Mr. Thompson, and Mr. Now. Lococo are directly involved with this issue. Speak up. This yeah, is I think Canada. It's time, I apologize. Mr. I think it's time. I Thank you very much. We're finished with this item. So, ladies and gentlemen, if I could just address, get you to please have a I look apologize, at I passed the resolution. Thank I you. will defend my civil liberty. I understand. Thank if you. If I got to die in jail, I will. Thank but you. I want some question answered by the mayor of Niagara Port. You, honorable mayor, you have the authority to take control of the court. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you sir. to you. So, so ladies Where's and gentlemen, all? if I, the, the issue that I have at hand with you right yeah, now, I that I have at hand right now, is uh, school buses putting cameras. And I just want to point out a couple of uh, uh, things, and I'm hoping that you'll help me push this to the region. Uh, the perfect storm of distracted drivers is happening right now. We have 575 school buses in Niagara, and they travel around 32,000 children. And we're having a problem with distracted drivers, everything from texting and driving to CAA recently. CAA South Central Ontario estimated 1.2 million Ontario drivers have gotten behind the wheel after consuming cannabis. So there's a lot of challenges with people between this and I should let you know that, where is the number here? Recent pilot was started to see what kind of reaction we're getting from drivers going by school buses. Well, last year, Mississauga did a two bus pilot 
Over 20 days, each bus averaged 2.5 blow-bys per bus per day. In Niagara Falls, New York, a similar program was tested by the Niagara Falls City School District. 20 cars were captured passing buses on blow-bys on the very first day alone. The Niagara County Legislature over the river just voted on a resolution unanimously putting cameras on all school buses. So we're trying to implement something meaningful and I was hoping that this resolution simply put would ask that the region in the same way that they um, do uh, monitor uh, body rubs and uh, strip parlors and these types of things that they could ensure that we can roll out cameras on the school buses for the people that are blowing by because unfortunately it's going to end up being something pretty significant and uh, I was hoping to make that resolution uh, push it forward from the City Council. So, Moved by Councillor Cario, second by Councillor Campbell. Oh, okay. Uh, conflict by Councillor Peterangelo, I understand, as he's a teacher with uh, one of the school boards. Is there any discussion to this well, motion? Just a yes, question. yes. Could we, could we also have it, uh, I don't know what the fines are mm -hmm. it, when we catch people doing this, so could we maybe have it reported back to us what the fines are? Because we, maybe we might want to ask for an inc even after we do this, maybe an increase of fines, maybe have them have a look at it. So if this continues to happen, that we could put some more teeth in it and make it even tougher on the people that do it. That's great, so we'll add that too, with, uh, with maybe add one of the whereas, or one of the, uh, therefore be it result, that fines be reviewed to the maximum and uh, made to be maximum or something to that effect, you can wordsmith that. Yeah. All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. <laughs> Motion for adjournment, Councillor Dabrowski, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? We're done. Thank you, everybody.